Section 18 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston Ducey de Vere. Ackham Editions, Description of the Festive Preparations for the Nuptials of the Prince Don Francesco of Tuscany, Part 14. Seventeenth Car of Sibylle. After these was seen coming Sibylle, the great mother of the gods, crowned with towers, and, for the reason that she is held to be goddess of the earth, robed in a vestment woven of various plants, with a scepter in the hand, and seated upon a quadrangular car, which contained many other empty seats besides her own, and was drawn by two great lions, and for the adornment of the car were painted with most beautiful design four of her stories. For the first of these was seen how, when she was conveyed from Pessimus to Rome, the ship that was carrying her being stuck fast in the Tiber, she was drawn miraculously to the bank, by the vestal Claudia, with only her own simple girdle, to the real marvel of the bystanders, even as for the second she was seen taken by command of her priests to the house of Scipio Nessica, who was judged to be the best and most holy man to be found in Rome at that time. But the third, likewise, she was seen visited in Phrygia by the goddess Ceres, after she thought to have hidden her daughter Persephone safely in Sicily and for the fourth and last she was seen flying from the fury of the giants into Egypt, as the poets relate, and constrained to transform herself into a blackbird. At the foot of the car, then, were seen riding ten Coravantes, armed with the ancient fashion, who were making various extravagant gestures of head and person, after whom were seen coming two Roman matrons in Roman dress, with the head covered by a yellow veil, and with them the above-named Scipio Nasica, and the Vestal Virgin Claudia, who had over the head a square white kerchief, with a border all around, which was fastened unto the throat. And for the last, to give a gracious conclusion to the little company, they were seen coming with an aspect of great loveliness, the young and beautiful Ares. Beloved most ardently, as we read, by Sibylle, who, besides the rich, easy, and charming costume of a huntsman, was seen most gracefully adorned by a very beautiful gilded collar. Eighteenth Car of Diana In the eighteenth an incredibly beautiful car, drawn by two white stags, they were seen coming with the gilded bow and gilded quiver, the huntress Diana, who was shown seated with infinite grace and loveliness upon two of the stags which, with their hindquarters made for her, as it were, a most fanciful seat, the rest of the car being rendered strangely gracious, lovely, and ornate by nine of her most pleasing fables. But the first of these was seen how, moved by pity for the flying Arethusa, who was seen pursued by the enamored Altheus, the goddess converted her into a fountain, even as for the second she was seen praying Escalpilus, that he should consent to restore to life for her the dead but innocent Hippolytus, which being accomplished, she was then seen in the third, ordaining him guardian of her temple and her sacred wood in Arica. For the fourth, she was seen chasing Cynthia, violated by Jove, from the pure waters where she used to bathe with her other virgin nymphs. And for the fifth was seen the deceit practiced by her on the above-named Alpheus, when, seeking presumptuously to obtain her as his wife, he was taken by her to see her dance, and there, having smeared her face with mire in company with the other nymphs, she constrained him, not being able to recognize her in that guise, to depart all derided and scorned. For the sixth, then, she was seen in company with her brother Apollo, chastising proud Niobe, and slaying her with all her children, and for the seventh she was seen sending the great and savage boar into the Caledonian forest, 
which laid all Italia waste, having been moved to just and righteous wrath against the people, because they had discontinued her sacrifices. Even as for the eighth she was seen not less wrathfully converting the unhappy Acteon into a stag, but in the ninth and last, moved on the contrary by pity, she was seen transforming Egeria, weeping for the death of her husband, Numa Pompilus, into a fountain. At the foot of the car, then, were seen coming eight of her huntress nymphs, with their bows and quivers dressed in graceful, pleasing, loose and easy garments, composed of skins of various animals, as it were slain by them, and with them as the last, concluding the small but gracious company, was young Verbius, crowned with spotted leaf myrtle, and holding in one hand a little broken chariot, and in the other a bunch of tresses, virginal and blonde. Nineteenth car of Ceres. In the nineteenth car, drawn by two great dragons, coming in no less pomp than the others, was seen Ceres, the goddess of green crops, in the habit of a matron, with a garland of ears of corn and with ruddy locks, and with no less pomp that car was seen, adorned by nine of her fables, which had been painted there. For the first of these was seen figured the happy birth of Pluto, the god of riches, born, as we read, in certain poets, from her and from the hero Iasius, even as for the second she was seen washing with great care and feeding with her own milk the little Triptolemus, son of Aleutius and Hyona. For the third was seen the same Tripolemus, flying by her advice upon one of the two dragons that had been presented to him by her, together with the car, to the end that he might go through the world piously teaching the care and cultivation of the fields, the other dragon having been killed by the impious king of the Getty, who sought with every effort likewise to slay Triptolinus. For the fourth she was seen how she hid her beloved daughter Persephone in Sicily, foreseeing in a certain sense that which afterwards befell her, even as in the fifth, likewise, she was seen after that event, as has been told elsewhere, going to Phrygia to visit her mother Sibylle, and in the sixth, as she was dwelling in that place, the same Persephone was seen appearing to her in a dream and demonstrating to her in what a plight she found herself from Pluto's rape of her, on which account, being all distraught, she was seen in the seventh returning in great haste to Sicily. For the eighth, likewise, was seen how, not finding her there, in her deep anguish she kindled two great torches, being moved to the resolution to seek her throughout the whole world. And in the ninth and last, she was seen arriving at the well of Cyane, and there coming by chance upon the girdle of her stolen daughter, a sure proof of what had befallen her. Whereupon in her great wrath, not having aught else on which to vent it, she was seen turning to break to pieces the rakes, hoes, ploughs, and other rustic implements that chanced to have been left there in the fields by the peasants. At the foot of the car, then, were seen walking figures signifying her various sacrifices. First, for those that are called the Ulyssima, the two little virgins attired in white vestments, each with a gracious little basket in the hands, one of which was seen to be all filled with various flowers, and the other was various ears of corn, after which for those sacrifices they were offered to Ceres as goddess of earth. There were seen coming two boys, two women, and two men, likewise all dressed in white, and all crowned with hyacinths, who were leading two great oxen, as it were, to sacrifice them. And then, for those others that were offered to Ceres, the lawgiver, called by the Greeks Thesmophilus, were seen coming two matrons only, very chaste in aspect, likewise dressed in white, and in like manner crowned with ears of corn and Agnes Castus. And after these, in order to display in full, the whole order of her sacrifices. They were seen coming three Greek priests, likewise attired in white draperies, two of whom carried in the hands two lighted torches, and the other an ancient lamp, likewise lighted. And finally the sacred company was concluded 
by the two heroes so much beloved by Ceres, of whom mention here has been made above. Triptolemus, namely, who carried a plow in the hand, and was shown riding upon a dragon, and Iasius, whom it was thought proper to figure in the easy, rich, and gracious habit of a huntsman. Twentieth car of Bacchus. Then followed the twentieth car of Bacchus, likewise shaped with singular artistry and with novel and truly most fanciful and bizarre invention, and it was seen in the form of a very graceful little ship, all overlaid with silver which was balanced in such wise upon a great base that had the true and natural appearance of the Cerulean Sea, that at the slightest movement it was seen with extraordinary pleasure for the spectators to roll from side to side in the very manner of a real ship upon the real sea. In it, besides the merry and laughing Bacchus, attired in the usual manner and set in the most commanding place, they were seen in company with Maron king of Thrace, some Bacantes, and some satyrs, all merry and joyful, sounding various cymbals and other such-like instruments, and since, as it were, from a part of that happy ship there rose an abundant fount of bright and foaming wine. They were seen not only drinking the wine very often from various cups, with much rejoicing, but also with the license that wine induces inviting the bystanders to drink and sing in their company. In place of a mast also, the little ship had a great tharus, wreathed in vine leaves, which supported a graceful and swelling sail, upon which, to the end that it might be gladsome and ornate, was seen painted many of those bacantes who, so it is said, are wont to run about, drinking and dancing and singing with much license, of a Mount Tinamus father of the choicest wines. At the foot of the car, then, was seen walking the beautiful Sisi, beloved by Bacchus, who had upon the head a garland, and in the hand a branch, a fig, and with her, likewise, was the other lover of the same Bacchus, Staphylae by name, who, being a great vine branch with many grapes that she carried in the hand, was also seen to have made in no less lovely fashion about her head with vine leaves and bunches of similar grapes, a green and graceful garland. After these came the fair and youthful Sissus, also beloved by Bacchus, who, falling by misfortune, was transformed by Mother Earth into ivy, on which account he was seen in a habit all covered with ivy in every part. And behind him was seen coming all Solinus, all naked and bound upon an ass with various garlands of ivy as if by reason of his drunkenness he were unable to support himself, and carrying attached to his girdle a great wooden cup all worn away, and with him likewise came the god of banquets, called by the ancient Comus, represented in the form of a ruddy, beardless, and most beautiful youth, all crowned with roses, but in aspect so somnolent and languid that it appeared almost as if the huntsman's war spear and the lighted torch that he carried in the hands might fall from them at any moment. There followed with the panther, upon the back of old and likewise ruddy and laughing drunkenness, attired in a red habit, with a great foaming vessel of wine in the hands, and with her the young and merry laughter, and behind these were seen, coming in the garb of shepherds and nymphs, two men and two women, followers of Bacchus, crowned and adorned in various ways with various leaves of the vine, and Semele, the mother of Bacchus, all smoking and scorched in memory of the ancient fable, with Narcius, the first ordinator of the sacrifices to Bacchus, who had a great he-goat upon his back, and was adorned with antique and shining arms, appeared to form a worthy, appropriate, and gracious end to that glad and festive company. Twenty-first and last car. The twenty-first and last car, representing the Roman mount Janiculum, and drawn by two great white rams, was given to the venerable Janus, taken with two heads, one young and the other old, as is the custom, and holding in the hands a great key and a thin wand, to demonstrate the power over doors and streets that is attributed to him. 
At the foot of the car was the incoming sacred religion, attired in white linen vestments, with one of the hands open, and carrying in the other an ancient altar with a burning flame, and on either side of her were the prayers represented as they are described by Homer in the form of two wrinkled, lame, cross-eyed, and melancholy old women, dressed in draperies of turquoise blue. After these were seen coming, Antivorta and Postvorta, the companions of divinity, of whom it was believed that the first had power to know whether prayers were or were not to be heard by the gods, and the second, who rendered account only of the past, was able to say whether prayers had or had not been heard the first being figured in the comely aspect and habit of a matron, with a lamp and a corn sieve in the hands, and a headdress covered with ants upon the head, and the second, clothed in front all in white, and figured with the face of an old woman, was seen to be attired at the back in heavy black draperies, and to have the hair, on the contrary, blonde, curling, and beautiful, such as is generally seen in young and love-compelling women. Then followed that favor, which we seek from the gods, to the end that our desires may have a happy and fortunate end. And he, although shown in the aspect of a youth, blind and with wings, and with a proud and haughty presence, yet at times appeared timid and trembling, because of the rolling wheel upon which he was seen standing, doubting that, as is often seen to happen, at every last turn, he might come with great ease to fall from it and with him was seen success, or, as we would rather say, the happy end of our enterprises, figured as a gay and lovely youth, holding in one of the hands a cup, and in the other an ear of corn and a poppy. Then there followed, in the form of a virgin crowned with oriental palm, with a star upon the brow, and with a branch of the same palm in the hand, Anna Perenna, revered by the ancients as a goddess, believing that she was able to make the year fortunate, and with her was seen coming two fetiales with the Roman toga, adorned with garlands of robini and with a sow and a stone in the hands, to denote the kind of oath that they were wont to take when they made any declaration for the Roman people. Behind these, then, following the religious ceremonies of war, was seen coming a Roman consul in the Gabinian and purple toga, and with the spear in the hand, and with him two Roman senators, likewise in the toga, and two soldiers in full armor, and with the Roman javelin. And finally, concluding their company and all the others, there followed money, attired in draperies of yellow, white, and tawny color, and holding in the hands various instruments for striking coins, the use of which, so it is believed, was first discovered and introduced as a thing necessary to the human race by Janus. Such were the cars and companies of that marvelous masquerade, the like of which was never seen before, and perchance will never be seen again in our day. And about it, leaving on one side as a burden too great for my shoulders, the vast and incomparable praises that would be due to it. There had been marshaled with much judgment, six very rich masks in the guise of sergeants, or rather captains, who, harmonizing very well with the invention of the whole, were seen, according as necessity demanded, running hither and thither and keeping all that long line, which occupied about half a mile of road, advancing into order with decorum and grace. Now, drawing near at length to the end of that splendid and most merry carnival, which would have been much more merry and celebrated with much more splendor if the inopportune death of Pius the Fourth, which happened a short time before, had not incommoded a good number of very reverend cardinals and other very illustrious lords from all Italy, who, invited to those most royal nuptials, had made preparations to come, and leaving on one side the rich and lovely inventions without number, seen in the separate masks, thanks to the amorous young men, not only in the innumerable banquets and other such-like entertainments, but wherever they broke a lance or tilted at the ring, now in one place and now in another, and wherever they made similar trial of their dexterity and valor 
and a thousand other games, and treating only of the last festival, which was seen on the last day, I shall say that although there had been seen the innumerable things, so rare, so rich, and so ingenious, of which mention has been made above, yet this festival, from the pleasing nature of the play, from the richness, emulation, and confidence shown in it by our craftsmen, some of whom, as always happens, considered themselves surpassed in the things accomplished, and from a certain extravagance and variety in the inventions, some of which appeared beautiful and ingenious, and others ridiculous and clumsy. This one, I say, also displayed an extraordinary, most charming beauty, and likewise gave to the admiring people, amid all that society, a pleasure and a delight that were marvelous and perhaps unexpected, and it was a buffalo race, composed of ten distinct companies, which were distributed, besides those that the sovereign princes took for themselves, partly among the lords of the court and the strangers, and partly among the gentlemen of the city, and the two colonies of merchants, the Spanish and the Genoese. First, then, upon the first buffalo that appeared in the appointed place, they were seen coming wickedness, adorned with great art and judgment, who was shown being chased, goaded, and beaten by six cavaliers likewise figured most ingeniously as scourging, or rather, scourges. After that, upon the second buffalo, which had the appearance of a lazy ass, was seen coming the old and drunken Salinas, supported by six bacchants, who was seen striving at the same time to goad and spur the ass, even as upon the third, which had the form of a calf, they was likewise seen coming the ancient Osiris, accompanied by six of the companions of soldiers with whom, it is believed, that deity traveled over many parts of the world and taught to the still new and barbarous races the cultivation of the fields. Upon the fourth, without any disguise, was placed as on horseback human life, likewise chased and goaded by six cavaliers who represented the years, even as upon the fifth, also without any disguise, was seen coming fame, with the many mouths and with the great wings of desire that are customary, also chased by six cavaliers who represented virtue or the virtues, which virtues, so it was said, chasing her, were aspiring to obtain the due and well-deserved reward of honor. Upon the sixth, then, was seen coming a very rich Mercury, who was shown being goaded and urged on no less than the others by six other similar figures of Mercury, and upon the seventh was seen the nurse of Romulus, Aca Laurentia, with six of her fratres Arvalus, who were not only urging her lazy animal to a run with their goads, but seemed almost to have been introduced to keep her company with much fittingness and pomp. Upon the eighth, next, was seen coming with much grace and richness, a large and very natural owl, with six cavaliers in the form of bats, most natural and marvelously similar to the reality, who, with most dexterous horses, goading the buffalo now from one side and now from another, was seen delivering a thousand joyous and most festive assaults. For the ninth, with singular artifice and ingenious illusion, there was seen, appearing little by little, a cloud, which, after it, had held the eyes of the spectators for some time in suspense, was seen in an instant, as it were, to part asunder, and from it issued the seafaring Messinus, seated upon the buffalo, which at once was seen pursued and pricked by six tritons, adorned in a very rich and most masterly fashion. And for the tenth and last they were seen coming, almost with the same artifice, but in a different, much larger form, and in a different color, another similar cloud, which, parting asunder in like manner, at the appointed place with smoke and flame and a horrible thunder, was seen to have within it infernal Pluto, drawn in his usual car, and from it, in a most gracious manner, was seen to come forth in place of a buffalo, a great and awful Cerberus, who was chased by six of those glorious ancient heroes who are supposed to dwell in peace in the Elysian fields. 
all those companies when they had appeared one by one upon the piazza and presented the due enclosure spectacle, and after a long breaking of the lances, a great caroling of horses and a thousand other such-like games with which the fair ladies and the multitude of spectators were entertained for a good time, finally made their way to the place where the buffaloes were to be set to race, and there the trumpets having sounded, and each company striving that its buffalo should arrive at the appointed goal before the others, and now one prevailing and now another. All of a sudden, when they were come within a certain distance of the place, all the air about them was seen filled with terror and alarm from the great and deafening fires that smote them now on one side and now on another, in a thousand strange fashions, insomuch that very often it was seen to happen that one who at the beginning had been nearest to winning the coveted prize, the timid and not very obedient animal taking fright at the noise, the smoke, and the fires above described, which in proportion as one went ahead became ever greater and assailed than one with ever greater vehemence, so that the animals turned in various directions and very often took to headlong flight. It was seen many times, I say, that the first were constrained to return among the last, while the confusion of men, buffaloes, and horses, and the lightning flashes, noises, and thunderings produced a strange, novel, and incomparable pleasure and delight, and thus with that spectacle was finally contrived a splendid, although for many perhaps disturbing, conclusion of the joyous and most festival carnival. In the first and holy days of the following Lent, with the thought of pleasing the most devout bride, but also with truly extraordinary pleasure for the whole people, who, having been deprived of such things for many years, and part of the fragile apparatus having been lost, feared that they would never be resumed. There was held the festival, so famous and so celebrated in olden days, of St. Felicia, so-called, from the church where it used formerly to be represented. But this time, besides that which their excellencies, our lords, themselves deigned to do, it was represented at the pains and expense of four of the principal and most ingenious gentlemen in the city in the church of St. Spirito, as a place more capacious and more beautiful, with the vast apparatus of machinery and all the old instruments, and not a few newly added. In it, besides many prophets and sibyls, who, singing in the simple ancient manner, announced the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, very notable, nay, marvelous, stupendous, and incomparable from its having been contrived in those ignorant ages, was the paradise, which, opening in an instant, was seen filled with all the hierarchies of the angels and of the saints, both male and female, and with various movements representing its different spheres, and as it were sending down to earth the divine Gabriel, shining with infinite splendor in the midst of eight other little angels, to bring the Annunciation to the glorious Virgin, who was seen waiting in her chamber, all humble and devout, all being let down and reascending afterwards, to the real marvel of every one, from the highest part of the cupola of that church, with the above described paradise was figured down to the floor of the chamber of the Virgin, which was not raised any great height from the ground, and all with such security and by method so beautiful, so facile and so ingenious, it appeared scarcely possible that the human brain was able to go so far. And with this, the festivities all arranged by our most excellent lords for those most royal nuptials had a conclusion not only renowned and splendid, but also, as was right fitting for true Christian princes, religious and devout. Many things also could have been told of a very noble spectacle presented by the most liberal Signor Paolo Giordano Orsino, Duke of Bracciano, in a great and most heroic theatre, all suspended in the air, which was constructed by him of woodwork in those days, with royal spirit and incredible expense, and in it, with very rich inventions of the knight's challengers, of whom he was one, and of the knight's adventurers, there was fought with various arms a combat for a barrier, and there was performed with beautifully trained horses, 
to the rare delight of the spectators, the graceful dance called the Pataglia. But this, being hindered by inopportune rains, was prolonged over many days, and since, seeking to treat of it at any length, it would require almost an entire work, being now weary, I believe that I may be pardoned, if without saying more of it, I bring this my long, I know not whether to call it tedious, labor at length to an end. End of section 18《セクション19 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston du C. de Vere. Giorgio Vasari, Description of the Works of Giorgio Vasari, Painter and Architect of Arezzo, Part 1. Having discoursed hitherto on the works of others, with the greatest diligence and sincerity that my brain has been able to command, I also wish at the end of these my labors to assemble together and make known to the world the works that the divine goodness and its grace has enabled me to execute, for the reason that, if indeed they are not of that perfection which I might wish, it will yet be seen by him who may consent to look at them with no jaundiced eye, that they have been wrought by me with study, diligence, and loving labor, and are therefore worthy, if not of praise, at least of excuse. Besides which, being out in the world and open to view, I cannot hide them. And since perchance at some time they might be described by some other person, it is surely better that I should confess the truth, and of myself accuse my imperfection, which I know only too well, being assured of this, that if, as I said, there may not be seen in them the perfection of excellence, they will be perceived at least in ardent desire to work well, great and indefatigable effort, and the extraordinary love that I bear to our arts. Wherefore it may come about that, according to the law, myself confessing openly my own deficiencies, I shall be in great part pardoned. To begin then with my earliest years, let me say that, having spoken sufficiently of the origin of my family, of my birth and childhood, and how I was set up by Antonio, my father, with all manner of lovingness on the path of the arts, and in particular that of design, to which he saw me much inclined, with good occasions in the life of Luca Signorella of Cortona, my kinsman, in that of Francesco Salviata, and in many other places in the present work. I shall not proceed to repeat the same things, but I must relate that after having drawn in my first years all the good pictures that are about the churches of Arezzo. The first rudiments were taught to me with some method by the Frenchman Guglielmo da Marsella, whose life and works we have described above. Then, having been taken to Florence in the year 1524 by Silvio Passerini, Cardinal of Cortona, I gave some little attention to design unto Michelangelo, Andrea del Sarto, and others. But the Medici, having been driven from Florence in the year 1527, and in particular Alessandro and Ippolito, with whom, young as I was, I had a straight attachment of service through the said cardinal, my paternal uncle Don Antonio, made me return to Arezzo, where a short time before my father had died of plague, which Don Antonio keeping me at a distance from the city lest I might be infected by the plague, was the reason that I, to avoid idleness, went about exercising my hand throughout the district of Arezzo, near our parts, painting some things in fresco for the peasants of the countryside, although as yet I had scarcely ever touched colors. In doing which I learned that to try your hand and work by yourself is helpful and instructive and enables you to gain excellent practice. In the year afterwards, 1528, 
the plague being finished. The first work that I executed was a little altar picture for the Church of St. Pietro of the Servite Friars at Arezzo. And in that picture, which is placed against a pilaster, are three half-length figures, St. Agatha, St. Rocco, and St. Sebastian. Being seen by Rosso, a very famous painter, who came in those days to Arezzo, it came about that he, recognizing in it something of the good taken from nature, desired to know me, and afterwards assisted me with designs and counsel. Nor was it long before by his means, Monsieur Lorenzo Gamarini gave me an altar picture to execute, for which Rosso made me the design, and I then painted with all the study, labor, and diligence that were possible to me in order to learn and to acquire something of a name, and if my powers had equaled my good will, I would have soon become a passing good painter. So much I studied and labored at the things of art, but I found the difficulties much greater than I had judged at the beginning. However, not losing heart, I returned to Florence, where, perceiving that I could not save only after a long time, become such as to be able to assist the three sisters and two younger brothers, left to me by my father, I placed myself with the goldsmith. But not for long, because in the year 1529, the enemy having come against Florence, I went off with the goldsmith Mano, who is very much my friend, to Pisa, where, setting aside the goldsmith's craft, I painted in fresco the arch that is over the door of the old company of the Florentines, and some pictures and oils, which were given to me to execute by means of Don Miniati Pitti, at that time Agate of Agnano, without the city of Pisa, and of Luigi Guicciardini, who was then in that city. Then, the war growing every day more general, I resolved to return to Arezzo, but, not being able to go by the direct and ordinary road, I made my way by the mountains of Medina to Bologna. There, Finding that some triumphal arches were being decorated in painting for the coronation of Charles V, young as I was, I obtained some work, which brought me honor and profit, and since I drew passing well, I would have found means to live and work there. But the desire that I had to revisit my family and other relatives brought it about that, having found good company, I returned to Arezzo, where, finding my affairs in a good state after the diligent care taken of them by the above-named Don Antonio, my uncle. I settled down with a quiet mind and applied myself to design, executing also some little things in oils of no great importance. Meanwhile, the above-named Don Miniati Pitti was made abbot or prior, I know not which, of St. Anna a monastery of Monte Oliveira, in the territory of Siena, and he sent for me, and so I made for him and for Abagna, their general, some pictures and other works in painting. Then, the same man having been made abbot of St. Bernardo in Arezzo, I painted for him two pictures in oils of Job and Moses on the balustrade of the organ, and since the work pleased those monks, they commissioned me to paint some pictures in fresco, namely the four evangelists, on the vaulting and walls of a portico before the principal door of the church, with God the Father on the vaulting, and some other figures large as life, in which, although as a youth of little experience, I did not do all that one more practice would have done. Nevertheless, I did all that I could, and work which pleased those fathers, having regard for my small experience and age. But scarcely had I finished that work when Cardinal Ippolito di Medici, passing through Arezzo by post, took me away to Rome to serve him, as has been related in the life of Salviati. And there, by the courtesy of that lord, I had facilities to attend for many months to the study of design. And I could say with truth that those facilities and my studies at that time were my true and principal master in my art, although before that those named above had assisted me not a little, and there had not gone from my heart the ardent desire to learn 
and the untiring zeal to be always drawing night and day. There was also a great benefit to me in those days, the competition of my young contemporaries and companions, who have since become, for the most part, very excellent in our art. Nor was it otherwise than a very sharp spur to me to have such a desire of glory, and to see many who had proved themselves very rare, and had risen to honor and rank, so that I used to say to myself at times, why should it not be in my power to obtain by a city of study and labor some of that grandeur and rank that so many others have acquired? They also were of flesh and bones as I am. Urged on, therefore, by so many sharp spurs and by seeing how much need my family had of me, I disposed myself never to shrink from any fatigue, discomfort, vigil, and toil in order to achieve that end. And having thus resolved in my mind, there remained nothing notable at that time in Rome or afterwards in Florence and in other places where I dwelt, that I did not draw in my youth, and not pictures only, but also sculptures and architectural works ancient and modern, and besides the proficients that I made in drawing the vaulting and chapel of Michelangelo, there remained nothing of Raffaella, Polidoro, and Baldassaro di Siena, that I did not likewise draw in company with Francesco Salviati, as has been told already in his life, and to the end that each of us might have drawings of everything. During the day, the one would not have drawn the same things as the other, but different, and then at night we used to copy each other's drawings, so as to save time and extend our studies. Not to mention that more often than not, we ate our morning meal standing up, and little at that. After which, incredible labor, the first work that issued from my hands as from my own forge, was a great picture with figures large as life, of a Venus with the graces adorning and beautifying her, with Cardinal de Medici caused me to paint. But of that picture there is no need to speak, because it was the work of a lad, nor would I touch on it, say that it is dear to me to remember still these first beginnings and many upward steps of my apprenticeship in the arts. Enough that that Lord and others gave me to believe that there was in it a certain something of a good beginning and of a lively and resolute spirit, and since, among other things, I had made therein to please my fancy, a lustful satyr who, standing hidden among some bushes, was rejoicing and feasting himself on the sight of Venus and the Graces nude, that so pleased the cardinal, that he had me clothed anew from head to foot, and then gave orders that I should paint in a larger picture, likewise in oils, the battle of the satyrs with the fawns sylvan gods and children, forming a sort of bacchanal, whereupon setting to work I made the cartoon and then sketched in the canvas in colors, which was ten brachia long, having then to depart in the direction of Hungary. The cardinal made me known to Pope Clement and left me to the protection of his holiness, who gave me into the charge of Signor Geronimo Montaguto, his chamberlain, with letters authorizing that if I might wish to fly from the air of Rome that summer, I should be received in Florence by Duke Alessandro, which it would have been well for me to do, because, choosing after all to stay in Rome, what with the heat, the air, and my fatigue, I fell sick in such sort that in order to be restored I was forced to have myself carried by letter to Arezzo. Finally, however, being well again, about the 10th of the following December I came to Florence, where I was received by the above-named Duke with kindly mien, and shortly afterwards given into the charge of the magnificent Monsieur Ottaviano di Medici, who so took me under his protection that as long as he lived he treated me always as a son, and his blessed memory I shall always remember and revere as of a most affectionate father. Returning then to my usual studies, I received facilities by means of that Lord to enter at my pleasure into a new sacristy of St. Lorenzo, where are the works of Michelangelo, he having gone in those days to Rome, and so I studied them for some time with much diligence, 
just as they were on the ground. Then, setting myself to work, I painted in a picture of three brachia, a dead Christ carried to the sepulcher by Nicodemus, Joseph, and others, and behind them the Maries weeping, which picture, when it was finished, was taken by Duke Alessandro. And it was a good and auspicious beginning for my labors, for the reason that not only did he hold it in account as long as he lived, but it has been ever since in the chamber of Duke Cosimo, and is now in that of the most illustrious prince, his son. And although at times I have desired to set my hand upon it again, in order to improve it in some parts, I have not been allowed. Duke Alessandro then, having seen this my first work, ordained that I should finish the ground floor room in the palace of the Medici, which had been left incomplete, as has been related by Giovanni di Udini. Whereupon, I painted there four stories of the actions of Caesar, his swimming with the commentaries in one hand and a sword in the mouth, his causing the writings of Pompeius to be burned in order not to see the works of his enemies, his revealing himself to a helmsman while tossed by fortune on the sea, and finally his triumph, but this last was not completely finished, during which time, although I was but little more than eighteen years of age, the duke gave me a salary of six crowns a month, a place at table for myself and a servant, and rooms to live in, with many other conveniences. And although I knew that I was very far from deserving so much, yet I did all that I could with diligence and lovingness, nor did I shrink from asking for my elders whatever I did not know myself. Wherefore, on many occasions, I was assisted with counsel and with work by Tribolo, Bandinelli, and others. I painted, then, in a picture three brachia high, Duke Alessandro himself in armor, portrayed from life, with a new invention in a seat formed of captives bound together, and with other fantasies. And I remember that besides the portrait, which was a very good likeness, in seeking to make the burnished surface of the armor bright, shining, and natural, I was not very far from losing my wits. So much did I exert myself in copying every last thing from the reality. However, despairing to be able to approach to the truth in the work, I took Jacopo de Pontormo, whom I revered for his great ability to see it and to advise me. And he, having seen the picture and perceived my agony, said to me lovingly, My son, as long as this real lustrous armor stands beside the picture, your armor will always appear to you as painted, for, although lead white is the most brilliant pigment that art employs, the iron is yet more brilliant and lustrous. Take away the real armor, and you will then see that your counterfeit armor is not such poor stuff as you think it. That picture, when it was finished, I gave to the duke, and the duke presented it to the Monsieur Ottaviano di Medici, in whose house it has been up to the present day, in company with the portrait of Caterina, the then young sister of the duke, and afterwards queen of France, and that of the magnificent Lorenzo the Elder. And in the same house are three pictures also by my hand, and executed in my youth. In one is Abraham, sacrificing Isaac, in the second, Christ in the garden, and in the third, his supper with the apostles. Meanwhile, Cardinal Ippolito died, in whom was centered the sum of all my hopes, and I began to recognize how vain generally are the hopes of this world, and that a man must trust mostly in himself and in being of some account. After these works, perceiving that the Duke was all given over to fortifications and to building, I began, the better to be able to serve him, to give attention to matters of architecture, and spent much time upon them. But meanwhile, festive preparations having to be made in Florence in the year 1536 for receiving the Emperor Charles V, the Duke, in giving orders for that, commanded the deputies charged with the care of those pomps, as has been related in the life of Tripolo, that they should have me with them, to design all the arches and other ornaments to be made for that entry. Which done, there was allotted to me for my benefit, 
besides the great banners of the castle and fortress, as has been told, the façade in the manner of a triumphal arch that was constructed by St. Felice in Piazza, forty braccia high and twenty wide, and then the ornamentation of the Porta a St. Piero Catalini, works all great and beyond my strength, and, what was worse, those favors having drawn down upon me a thousand envious thoughts about twenty men who were helping me to do the banners, and the other labors left me nicely in the lurch, at the persuasion of one person or another, to the end that I might not be able to execute works so many, and of such importance. But I, who had foreseen the malice of such creatures, to whom I had always sought to give assistance, partly laboring with my own hand day and night, and partly aided by painters brought in from without, who helped me secretly, attended to my business, and strove to conquer all such difficulties and treacheries by means of the works themselves. During that time, Bertoldo Corsini, who was then profeted a general to his excellency, had reported to the Duke that I had undertaken to do so many things that it would never be possible for me to have them finished in time, particularly because I had no men and the works were much in arrears. Whereupon the Duke sent for me and told me what he had heard, and I answered that my works were well advanced, as His Excellency might see at his pleasure, and that the end would do credit to the whole. Then I went away, and no long time passed before he came secretly to where I was working, and, having seen everything, recognized in part the envy and malice of those who were pressing upon me without having any cause. The time having come, when everything was to be in order, I had finished my works to the last detail, and set them in their places, to the great satisfaction of the Duke and of all the city whereas those of some who had thought more of my business than of their own were set in place unfinished. When the festivities were over, besides four hundred crowns that were paid to me for my work, the Duke gave me three hundred that were taken away from those who had not carried their works to completion by the appointed time, according as had been arranged by agreement. And with those earnings and donations I married one of my sisters, and shortly afterwards settled another as a nun in the Mirata at Arezzo, giving to the convent besides the dowry, or rather alms, an altar picture of the Annunciation by my hand, with the tabernacle of the sacrament accommodated in that picture, which was placed within their choir, where they performed their offices, having then received from the company of the Corpus Domino at Arezzo the commission for the altarpiece of the high altar of St. Domenico. I painted in it Christ taken down from the cross, and shortly afterwards I began for the company of St. Rocco, the altar picture of their church in Florence. End of section 19《Section 20 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston Ducey de Vere. Giorgio Vasari, Description of the Works of Giorgio Vasari, Painter and Architect of Arezzo, Part 2. Now, while I was going on winning for myself honor, name, and wealth under the protection of Duke Alessandro, that poor lord was cruelly murdered, and there was snatched away from me all hope of that which I was promising to myself from fortune by means of his favor. Wherefore, Having been robbed within a few years of Clement, Ippolito, and Alessandro, I resolved at the advice of Monsieur Ottaviano that I would never again follow the fortune of courts, but only art, although it would have been easy to establish myself with Signor Cosimo di Medici, the new duke, and so, while carrying forward in Arezzo 
the above-named altar picture in the facade of St. Rocco, with the ornament, I was making preparations to go to Rome, one by means of Monsieur Giovanni Polistra, and by the will of God, to whom I have always commended myself, and to whom I attribute and have always attributed my every blessing, I was invited to Camaldoli, the center of the Camaldolese congregation, by the fathers of that hermitage, to see that which they were designing to have done in their church. Arriving there, I found supreme pleasure in the Alpine, and eternal solitude and quietness of that holy place. And although I became aware of the first moment that those fathers of venerable aspect were beside themselves at seeing me so young, I took heart and talked to them to such purpose that they resolved that they would avail themselves of my hand in the many pictures in oils and in fresco that were to be painted in their church at Camadoli. Now, while they wished that before any other thing I should execute the picture of the high altar, I proved to them with good reason that it was better to paint first one of the lesser pictures, which were going into the tremezzo, and that, having finished it, if it should please them, I would be able to continue. Beside that, I would not make any fixed agreement with them as to money, but said that if my work when finished were to please them, they might pay me for it as they chose, and if it did not please them, they might return it to me, and I would keep it for myself most willingly, which condition appearing to them only too honest and loving. They were content that I should set my hand to the work. They said to me then that they wished to have it, Our Lady with her son in her arms, and St. John the Baptist and St. Jerome, who were both hermits and lived in woods and forests, and I departed from the hermitage and made my way down to the Abbey of Camaldoli, where, having made a design with great rapidity, which pleased them, I began the altarpiece and in two months had it completely finished and set in place. To the great satisfaction of those fathers, as they gave me to understand, and of myself, and in that period of two months I proved how much more one is assisted in studies by sweet tranquility and honest solitude than by the noises of public squares and courts. I recognized, I say, my error in having in the past placed my hopes in men and in the follies and intrigues of this world. That altarpiece finished. Then they allotted to me straightway the rest of the tremezzo of the church namely the scenes and other things in fresco work to be painted there, both high and low, which I was to execute during the following summer, for the reason that in the winter it would be scarcely possible to work in fresco at that altitude among those mountains. Meanwhile, I returned to Arezzo and finished the altarpiece with St. Rocco, painting in it Our Lady, Six Saints, and a God the Father with some thunderbolts in his hand representing the pestilence, which he is in the act of hurling down. But St. Rocco and other saints make intercession for the people, and in the façade are many figures in fresco, which, like the altarpiece, are no better than they should be. Then Fra Bartomeo Gratiani, a friar of St. Augustino in Monte San Savino, sent to invite me to Val di Caprisi, and commissioned me to execute a great altarpiece in oils for the high altar of the Church of St. Agostino in that same Monte San Savino. And after we had come to an agreement, I made my way to Florence to see Monsieur Ottaviano, where, staying several days, I had much ado to prevent myself from re-entering the service of the court, as I was minded not to do. However, by advancing good reasons, I won the battle, and I resolved that by hook or by crook, before doing anything else, I would go to Rome. But in that I did not succeed until I had made for that same Messer Ottaviano a copy of the picture in which formerly Raffaello di Urbino had portrayed Pope Leo, Cardinal Giulio de Medici, and Cardinal de Rossi, for the Duke was claiming the original which was then in the possession of Messer Ottaviano, and the copy 
that I made is now in the house of the heirs of that Lord, who, on my departure for Rome, wrote me a letter of exchange for five hundred crowns on Giovanni Battista Puccini, which he was to pay me on demand, and said to me, Use this money to enable you to attend to your studies, and afterwards, when you find it convenient, you can return it to me either in work or in cash, just as you please. Arriving in Rome, then, in February the year 1538, I stayed there until the end of June, giving my attention in company with Giovanni Battista Conchi of the Borgo, my assistant, to drawing all that I had left not drawn the other times I had been in Rome, and particularly everything that was in the underground grottoes. Nor did I leave anything either in architecture or in sculpture that I did not draw and measure, insomuch that I can say with truth that the drawings that I made in that space of time were more than three hundred, and for many years afterwards I found pleasure and advantage in examining them, refreshing the memory of the things of Rome, and how much these labors and studies benefited me, was seen after my return to Tuscany in the altar picture that I executed at Monte San Savino, in which I painted with a somewhat better manner the Assumption of Our Lady, and at the foot besides the apostles who are about the sepulchre, St. Augustine and St. Romaldo, having then gone to Camaldoli, According, as I had promised those Eremite fathers, I painted in the other altarpiece of the Terramezzo the Nativity of Jesus Christ, representing a night illumined by the splendor of the newborn Christ, who is surrounded by some shepherds adoring him, in doing which I strove to imitate with colors the rays of the sun and copy the figures and all the other things in that work from nature and in the proper light to the end that they might be as similar as possible to the reality. Then, since that light could not pass above the hut, from there upwards and all around I availed myself of a light that comes from the splendor of the angels that are in the air, singing Gloria in excelsis Deo. Not to mention that in certain places the shepherds that are around make light with burning sheaves of straw and also the moon and the star, and the angel that is appearing to certain shepherds. For the building then, I made some antiquities after my own fancy, with broken statues and other things of that kind. In short, I executed that work with all my power and knowledge, and although I did not satisfy with the hand and the brush, my great desire and eagerness to work supremely well, nevertheless, the picture has pleased many. Wherefore, Messer Fausto Savio, a man of great learning who was then custodian of the Pope's library, and some others after him, wrote many Latin verses in praise of that picture, moved perhaps more by affectionate feeling than by the excellence of the work. Be that as it may, if there be in it anything of the good, it was the gift of God, that altar picture finished, those fathers resolved that I should paint in fresco on the façade the stories that were to be there, whereupon I painted over the door a picture of the Hermitage, with Saint Romaldo and a doge of Venice, who was a saintly man on one side, and on the other a vision, which the above-named saint had in that place where he afterwards made his hermitage, with some fantasies, grotesques, and other things that are to be seen there, which done... They ordained that I should return in the summer of the following year to execute the picture of the high altar. Meanwhile, the above-named Don Miniato Pitti, who was then visited to the congregation of Mont Oliveto, having seen the altar picture at Monte Savino and the works of Canaladi, and finding in Bologna the Florentine Don Felipe Seragli, abbot of St. Michel in Bosco, said to him that, since the refectory of that honored monastery was to be painted, it appeared to him that the work should be allotted to me, and not to another. Being therefore summoned to go to Bologna, I undertook to do it, although it was a great and important work. But first I desired to see all the most famous works in painting that were in that city, both by Bolognese and by others, 
the work of the head wall of that refectory was divided into three pictures. In one was to be when Abraham prepared food for the angels in the valley of Monre, and in the second, Christ in the house of Mary Magdalene and Martha, speaking with Martha and saying to her that Mary had chosen the better part. And in the third was to be St. Gregory at table with twelve poor men, among whom he recognized one as Christ. Then, setting my hand to the work, I depicted in the last St. Gregory at table in a convent, served by white friars of that order, that I might be able to include those fathers therein, according to their wish. Besides that, I made in the figure of the saintly pontiff the likeness of Pope Clement the Seventh, and about him, among many lords, ambassadors, princes, and other personages who stand there to see him eat, I portrayed Duke Alessandro de Medici, in memory of the benefits and favors that I had received from him and of his having been what he was, and with him many of his friends, and among those who are the serving poor men at table. I betrayed some friars of that convent with whom I was intimate, such as the stranger's attendants who waited upon me, the dispenser, the cellular, and others of the kind, and so also the abbot Seragli, the general Don Cipriano de Verona, and Pentevelglia, in like manner, I copied the vestments of that pontiff from the reality, counterfeiting velvets, damasks, and other draperies of silk and gold of every kind. But the service of the table, vases, animals, and other things, I caused to be executed by Cristofano or the Borgo, as was told in his life. In the second scene, I sought to make the heads, draperies, and buildings not only different from the first, but in such manner as to make as clearly evident as possible the lovingness of Christ in instructing the Magdalene, and the affection and readiness of Martha in arranging the table, and her lamentation at being left alone by her sister in such labors and service, to say nothing of the attentiveness of the apostles, and of many other things worthy of consideration in that picture. As for the third scene, I painted the three angels coming to do this I not know how, within a celestial light which seems to radiate from them, while the rays of the sun surround the cloud in which they are. Of the three angels, the old Abraham is adoring one, although those that he sees are three, while Sarah stands laughing and wondering how that can come to pass, which has been promised to her. And Hagar, with Ishmael in her arms, is departing from the hospitable shelter. The same radiance also gives light to some servants who are preparing the table, among whom are some who, not being able to endure that splendor, place their hands over their eyes and seek to shade themselves. Which variety of things, since strong shadows and brilliant lights give greater force to pictures, cause this one to have more relief than the other two, and the colors being varied, they produced a very different effect. But would I had been able to carry my conception into execution, even as both then and afterwards, with new inventions and fantasies, I was always seeking out the laborious and difficult in art. This work, then, whatever it may be, was executed by me in eight months, together with the frieze in fresco architectural ornaments, carvings, seat backs, panels, and other adornments over the whole work and the whole refectory, and the price of all I was content to make two hundred crowns, as one who aspired more glory than to gain. Wherefore, Monsieur Andrea Alchiati, my very dear friend, who was then reading in Bologna, caused these words to be placed at the foot. Octonus mensibus opus, ab aretino, Giorgio Pictum, non tam persio quam amicorum obsequis et honoris voto, anno 1539, Philippus Seralius Pon, cure of it. At this time I executed two little altarpieces of the dead Christ and of the resurrection, which were placed by the abbot Don Miniato Pitti in the church of St. Maria di Fabriano without San Gimiano, in Biagio, and other Bolognese painters, 
thinking that I was seeking to establish myself in Bologna and to take their works and commissions out of their hands, kept molestingly, unceasingly. But they did more harm to themselves than to me, and their envious ways moved me to laughter. In Florence, then, I copied for Monsieur Ottaviano a large portrait of Cardinal Ippolito, down to the knees and other pictures, with which I kept myself occupied until the insupportable heat of summer, which, having come, I returned to the quiet and freshness of Camodoli, in order to execute the above-mentioned altarpiece of the high altar. In that work I painted a Christ taken down from the cross, with the greatest study and labor that were within my power, and since, in the course of the work and up time, it seemed necessary to me to improve certain things, and I was not satisfied with the first sketch. I gave it another printing, and repainted it all anew, as it is now to be seen, and then, attracted by the solitude and staying in that same place, I executed there a picture for the same Messer Ottaviano, in which I painted a young St. John, nude, among some rocks and crags that I copied from nature among those mountains. And I had scarcely finished these works, when there arrived in Camaldoli, Messer Bindo Altavati, who wished to arrange a transportation of great fir trees to Rome by way of the Tiber, for the fabric of St. Pietro from the cellar de St. Alberigo, a place belonging to those fathers, and he, seeing all the works executed by me in that place, and by my good fortune liking them, resolved before he departed thence that I should paint an altar picture for his church of St. Apostolo in Florence. Wherefore, having finished that of Camaldoli, with the façade of the chapel in fresco, wherein I made the experiment of combining work in oil colors with the other, and succeeded passing well. I made my way to Florence, and there executed that altar picture. Now, having to give a proof of my powers in Florence, where I had not yet executed such a work, and having many rivals, and also a desire to acquire a name, I resolved that I would do my utmost to that work, and put into it all the diligence that I might find possible. And in order to be able to do that free from every vexatious thought, I first married my third sister and bought a house already begun in Arezzo, with a site for making most beautiful gardens in the Borgo di St. Vito, in the best air of that city. In October then of the year 1540, I began the altar picture for Messer Bindo, proposing to paint in it a scene that should represent the conception of Our Lady according to the title of the chapel, which subject presenting no little difficulty to me. Messer Bindo and I took the opinions of many common friends, men of learning, and finally I executed it in the following manner. Having depicted the tree of the primal sin in the middle of the picture, I painted at its roots Adam and Eve naked and bound, as the first transgressors of the commandments of God, and then one by one, bound to the other branches, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, David, and the other kings in succession, according to the order of time, all, I say, bound by both arms, excepting Samuel and John the Baptist, who are bound by one arm only, because they were blessed in the womb. I painted there also with the tail wound about the trunk of the tree, the ancient serpent, who, having a human form from the middle upwards, has the hands bound behind, and upon his head, treading upon his horns, is one foot of the glorious virgin, who has the other on a moon, being herself all clothed with the sun, and crowned with twelve stars. The virgin, I say, is supported in the air, within a splendor, by many nude little angels who are illumined by the rays that come from her, which rays, likewise, passing through the leaves of the tree, shed light upon those bound to it, and appear to be loosing their bonds by means of the virtue and grace that they bring from her from whom they proceed. And in the heaven at the top of the picture are two children that are holding certain scrolls in which are written these words, Quos ive copi damanefit, Marley gracia solvit. In short, 
so far as I can remember, I had not executed any work up to that time, with more study or with more lovingness and labor. But all the same, while I may perhaps have satisfied others, I did not satisfy myself, although I know the time, study, and labor that I devoted to it, particularly to the nudes and heads, and indeed to every part. For the labors of that picture, Messer Bindo gave me three hundred crowns of gold, besides which, in the following year, he showed me so many courtesies and kindnesses in his house in Rome, where I made him a copy of the same altarpiece in the little picture, almost in miniature, that I shall always feel an obligation to his memory. At the same time that I painted that picture, which was placed, as I have said, in St. Apostoli, I executed for Monsieur Ottaviano di Medici a Venus and Alida from the cartoons of Michelangelo, and in a large picture of St. Jerome in penitence of the size of life, who, contemplating the death of Christ, whom he has before him on the cross, is beating his breast in order to drive from his mind the thoughts of Venus and the temptations of the flesh, which at times tormented him, although he lived in woods and places wild and solitary, as he relates of himself at great length. To demonstrate which I made a Venus, who, with love in her arms, is flying from that contemplation, and holding play by the hand, while the quiver and arrows have fallen to the ground. Besides which, the shaft shot by Cupid against that saint, returned to him all broken, and some that fall are brought back to him by the doves of Venus in their beaks. All these pictures, although perhaps at that time they pleased me, and were made by me as best I knew, I know not how much they please me at my present age, but since art in itself is difficult, it is necessary to take from him who paints the best that he can do. This, indeed, I will say, because I can say it with truth, that I have always executed my pictures, inventions, and designs, whatever may be their value. I do not say only with the greatest possible rapidity, but also with incredible facility and without effort, for which let me call to witness, as I have mentioned in another place, the vast canvas that I painted in six days only, for St. Giovanni in Florence, in the year 1542, for the baptism of the Lord Don Francesco di Medici, now Prince of Florence and Siena. End of section 20. Section 21 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari, translated by Gaston Ducey de Vere. Giorgio Vasari, Description of the Works of Giorgio Vasari, Painter and Architect of Arezzo, Part 3. Now, although I wished after these works to go to Rome in order to satisfy Messer Bindo Altaviti, I did not succeed in doing it, because, being summoned to Venice by Messer Pietro Arutini, a poet of illustrious name at that time, and much my friend, I was forced to go there, since he much desired to see me, and moreover I did it willingly, in order to see on that journey the works of Tiziano and of other painters, in which purpose I succeeded, for in a few days I saw the works of Correggio at Medina and Parma, those of Giulio Romano at Mantua, and the antiquities of Verona. Having finally arrived in Venice with two pictures painted by my hand from cartoons by Marco Angelo, I presented them to Don Diego de Mendoza, who sent me two hundred crowns of gold. Nor I had it long been in Venice, when at the entreaty of Aretino, I executed for the gentlemen of the Calza the scenic setting for a festival that they gave, wherein I had as many companions, Battista Cuncio, and Cristofano Gerardi, a Borgio, a San Sepulcro, and Bastiano Flori of Arezzo, men very able and well practised, 
of all which enough has been said in another place, and also the nine painted compartments in the palace of Messer Giovanni Carrara, which are in the soffit of a chamber in that palace, which is by St. Benedetto. After these and other works of no little importance that I executed in Venice at that time, I departed, although I was overwhelmed by the commissions that were coming to me, on the 16th of August in the year 1542, and returned to Tuscany. There, before consenting to put my hand to any other thing, I painted on the vaulting of a chamber that had been built by my orders in my house, which I have already mentioned, all the arts that are subordinate to or depend upon design. In the center is a fame who is seated upon the globe of the world and sounds a golden trumpet, throwing away one of fire that represents calumny, and about her into order are all those arts with their instruments in their hands, and since I had not time to do the whole, I left eight ovals in order to paint in them eight portraits from life of the first men in our arts. In those same days I executed in fresco for the nuns of St. Margarita, in the same city, in a chapel of their garden, a nativity of Christ with figures the size of life, and having thus passed the rest of that summer in my own country, and part of the autumn I went to Rome, where, having been received by the above-named Messer Bindo with many kindnesses, I painted for him in the picture in oils a Christ the size of life, taken down from the cross and laid on the ground at the feet of his mother, with Phoebus in the air obscuring the face of the sun and Diana that of the moon, in the landscape all darkened by that gloom, some rocky mountain shaken by the earthquake that was caused by the passion of the Savior, are seen shivered into pieces, and certain dead bodies of saints are seen rising again, and issuing from their sepulchres in various manners, which picture, when finished, was not displeasing to the gracious judgment of the greatest painter, sculptor, and architect that there has been in our times and perchance in the past. By means of that picture also, I became known to the most illustrious Cardinal Farnese, to whom it was shown by Giovia and Messer Bindo, and at his desire I made for him in a picture a brachia high and four broad, a justice who is embracing an ostrich laden with the twelve tables, and with the scepter that has the stork at the point, and the head covered by a helmet of iron and gold, with three feathers of different colors, the device of the just judge. She is wholly nude from the waist upwards, and she is bound to her girdle with chains of gold as captives, the seven vices that are opposed to her. Corruption, ignorance, cruelty, fear, treachery, falsehood, and calumny. Above these, upon their shoulders, is placed truth wholly nude, offered by time to justice, with the present of two doves representing innocence, and upon the head of that truth, justice is placing a crown of oak, signifying fortitude of mind, which whole work I executed with all care and diligence, according to the best of my ability. At this time, I paid constant attention to Michelangelo Bonarotti, and took his advice in all my works, and he, in his goodness, conceived much more affection for me, and his counsel, after he had seen some of my designs, was the reason that I gave myself a new and with better method to the study of the matters of architecture, which probably I never would have done if that most excellent man had not said to me what he did say, which out of modesty I forbear to tell. At the next festival of St. Peter, the heat being very great in Rome, where I spent all that winter of 1543, I returned to Florence, where in the house of Messer Ottaviano di Medici, which I call my own, I executed an altarpiece for Monsieur Biagio May of Luca, his gossip, the same conception as in that of Messer Bindo in St. Apostolo. Although I varied everything with the exception of the invention, and that picture, when finished, was placed in his chapel in St. Pietro Cicoli of Luca, in another of the same size, namely, seven brachia high and four broad, I painted Our Lady, 
St. Jerome, St. Luke, St. Cecilia, St. Martha, St. Augustine, and St. Guido the Hermit, which altar picture was placed in the Domo of Pisa, where there were many others by the hands of excellent masters, and I had scarcely carried that one to completion when the warden of works of that Domo commissioned me to execute another, in which, since it was to be the likeness of Our Lady in order to bury it from the other, I painted the Madonna with the dead Christ at the foot of the cross, lying in her lap, the thieves on high upon the crosses, and grouped with the Maries and Nicodemus, who are standing there, the titular saints of those chapels, all forming a good composition and rendering the scene in that picture pleasing. Having returned again to Rome in the year 1544, besides many pictures that I executed for various friends, of which there is no need to make mention, I made a picture of a Venus from a design by Michelangelo by Monsieur Bindo Altavati, who took me once more into his house, and for Galeato da Giurana, a Florentine merchant, I painted an altar picture in oils of Christ taken down from the cross, which was placed in his chapel in the church of St. Augustino at Rome, in order to be able to paint that picture in comfort, together with some works that had been allotted to me by Tiberio Crispo, the castellan of Castle St. Giangelo. I had withdrawn by myself to that palace in the Trastevere, which was formerly built by Bishop Adamari, below St. Onofrio, and which has since been finished by the seconds of the Adi. But feeling indisposed and wearied by my infinite labors, I was forced to return to Florence. There I executed some pictures, and among others, one in which were Dante, Petrarca, Guido Calvacanti, Boccaccio, Sina di Pistorio, and Guttino de Rizzo, accurately copied from the ancient portraits and of that picture which afterwards belonged to Luca Martini. Many copies have been made. In that same year of 1544, I was invited to Naples by Don Giamatteo of Aversa, general of the monks of Monte Alavito, to the end that I might paint the refectory of a monastery built for them by King Alfonso I. But when I arrived, I was not for accepting the work, seeing that the refectory and the whole monastery were built in an ancient manner of architecture, with the vaults and painted arches, low and poor in lights, and I doubted that I was like to win little honor thereby. However, being pressed by Don Miniato Pitti and Don Ippolito da Milano, my very dear friends, who were then visitors to that order, finally accepted the undertaking, whereupon, recognizing that I would not be able to do anything good, save only with an abundance of ornaments dazzling the eyes of all who might see the work, with a variety and multitude of figures, I resolved to have all the vaulting of the refectory wrought in stucco, in order to remove by means of rich compartments in the modern manner all the old-fashioned and clumsy appearance of those arches. In this I was much assisted by the vaults and walls, which are made, as is usual in that city, of blocks of tufa, which cut like wood are even better, like bricks not completely baked, and thus cutting them, I was able to sink squares, ovals, and octagons, and also to thicken them with additions of the same tufa by means of nails. Having then reduced those vaults to good proportions and with that stucco work, which was the first to be wrought in Naples in the modern manner, and in particular the facades and end walls of the refractory, I painted there six panels in oils, seven brachia high, three to each end wall. In three that are over the entrance of the refectory is the manna raining down upon the Hebrew people in the presence of Moses and Aaron and the people gathering it up, wherein I strove to represent a variety of attitudes and vestments in the men, women, and children, and the emotion wherewith they are gathering up and stirring the manna, rendering thanks to God. On the end wall that is at the head is Christ at table in the house of Simon, and Mary Magdalene with tears, washing his feet and drying them with her hair, showing herself all penitent for her sins, which story is divided into three pictures. In the center, the supper. On the right hand, a buttery, 
with a credence of full vases and various fantastic forms, and on the left hand a steward, who is bringing up the viands. The vaulting, then, was divided into three parts. In one, the subject is faith, in the second, religion, and in the third, eternity. And each of these forms a center with eight virtues about it, demonstrating to the monks that in that refectory they eat what is requisite for the perfection of their lives. To enrich the spaces of the vaulting, I made them full of grotesques, which serve as ornaments in forty-eight spaces for the forty-eight celestial signs, and on six walls down the length of that refectory, under the windows, which were made larger and richly ornamented, I painted six of the parables of Jesus Christ, which are in keeping with that place, and to all those pictures and ornaments there correspond the carvings of the seats, which are wrought very richly. And then I executed for the high altar of the church, an altarpiece, eight brachia high, containing the Madonna presenting the infant Jesus Christ to Simon in the temple, with a new invention. It is a notable thing that since Giotto, there had not been up to that time in a city so great and noble any masters who had done anything of importance in painting, although there had been brought there from without some things by the hands of Perugia Gina and Raphaello, on which I account I exerted myself to labor in such a manner, in so far as my little knowledge could reach, that the intellects of that country might be roused to execute great and honorable works." and whether that or some other circumstance may have been the reason, between that time and the present day, many very beautiful works have been done there, both in stucco and in painting. Besides the pictures I described above, I executed in fresco on the vaulting of the stranger's apartment in the same monastery, with figures large as life, Jesus Christ with the cross on his shoulder, and many of his saints who have one likewise on their shoulders in imitation of him, to demonstrate that for one who wishes truly to follow him, it is necessary to bear with good patience the adversities that the world inflicts. For the general of that order I executed a great picture of Christ, appearing to the apostles as they struggled with the perils of the sea, and taking St. Peter by the arm, who having hastened towards him through the water, was fearing to drown, and in another picture for Abbot Cappuccino, I painted the resurrection. These works carried to completion, I painted a chapel in fresco for the Lord Don Pietro di Toledo, Viceroy of Naples, in his garden at Polizzolo, besides executing some very delicate ornaments in stucco, and arrangements had been made to execute two great loggi for the same Lord, but the undertaking was not carried into effect, for the following reason. There had been some difference between the viceroy and the above-named monks, and the constable went with his men to the monastery to seize the abbot and some monks who had had some words with the black friars in a procession over a matter of precedence. But the monks made some resistance, assisted by about fifteen young men who were assisting me in stucco work and painting, and wounded some of the bailiffs on which account it became necessary to get them out of the way, and they went off in various directions, and so I, left almost alone, was unable not only to execute the loggia at Pozuolo, but also to paint twenty-four pictures of stories from the Old Testament and from the life of St. John the Baptist, which, not caring to remain any longer in Naples, I took to Rome to finish, whence I sent them, and they were placed about the stalls and over the presses of walnut wood made for my architectural designs in the sacristy of St. Giovanni Cabanaro, a convent of Aramite in Observantine Friars of St. Augustine, for whom I had painted a short time before, for a chapel without their church, a panel picture of Christ crucified, with a rich and varied ornament of stucco, at the request of Serapondo, their general, who afterwards became a cardinal. In like manner, halfway up the staircase of the same convent, I painted in fresco a St. John the Evangelist, who stands gazing at Our Lady, clothed with the sun and crowned with twelve stars, with her feet upon the moon. In the same city, I painted for Messer Tommaso Cambi, a Florentine merchant and very much my friend, 
the times and seasons of the year on four walls in the hall of his house, with pictures of sleep and dreaming over a terrace where I made a fountain. And for the Duke of Gravina, I painted an altar picture of the Magi adoring Christ, which he took in his dominions. And for Orsaco, secretary to the viceroy, I executed another altarpiece with five figures around a Christ crucified and many pictures. But although I was regarded with favor by those lords and was earning much, and my commissions were multiplying every day, I judged, since my men had departed and I had executed works in abundance in one year in that city, that I would be well for me to return to Rome, which, having done, the first work that I executed was with Signor Ranuccio Farnese, at that time Archbishop of Naples, painting on canvas and in oils four very large shutters for the organ of the Priscopio in Naples, on the front of which are five patron saints of that city, and on the inner side the nativity of Jesus Christ, with the shepherds and King David singing to his psaltery, Dominus Dixit Ad Me, etc. And I finished likewise the twenty-four pictures mentioned above, and some for Monsieur Tommaso Cambi, which were all sent to Naples, which done. I painted five pictures of the Passion of Christ for Raffaello Acciaoli, who took them to Spain. In the same year, Cardinal Farnese, being minded to cause the hall of the Cancellaria in the palace of St. Giorgio to be painted, Monsignor Giovio, desiring that it should be done by my hands, commissioned me to make many designs with various inventions, which in the end were not carried into execution. Nevertheless, the cardinal finally resolved that it should be painted in fresco, and with the greatest rapidity that might be possible, so that he might be able to use it at a certain time determined by himself. That hall is a little more than a hundred palms in length, fifty in breadth and the same in height. On each end wall, fifty palms broad, was painted a great scene, and two on one of the long walls, but on the other, from its being broken by windows, it was not possible to paint scenes, and therefore there was made a pendant after the likeness of the head wall opposite, and not wishing to make a base, as had been the custom up to that time with the craftsmen in all their scenes, in order to introduce variety and do something new. I caused flights of steps to rise from the floor to a height of at least nine palms, made in various ways, one to each scene, and upon these, then, there begin to ascend figures that I painted in keeping with the subject, little by little, until they come to the level where the scene begins. It would be a long and perhaps tedious task to describe all the particulars and minute details of those scenes, and therefore I shall touch only on the principal things, and that briefly. In all of them, then, are stories of the actions of Pope Paul III, and in each in his portrait from life. In the first, wherein are the dispatching, so to speak, of the court of Rome, may be seen upon the type of various embassies of various nations, with many portraits from life, that are come to seek favors from the Pope and to offer him diverse tributes, and in addition, two great figures in great niches, placed over the doors, which are on either side of the scene. One of these represents eloquence, and has above it two victories that uphold the head of Julius Caesar, and the other represents justice, with two other victories that hold the head of Alexander the Great, and in the center are the arms of the above-named Pope, supported by liberality and remuneration. On the main wall is the same Pope, remunerating merit, distributing salaries, knighthoods, benefices, pensions, bishoprics, and cardinals' hats, and among those who are receiving them are Satellito, Paolo, Bembo, Caterini, Giovio, Bonarotti, and other men of excellence, all portrayed from life, and on that wall, within a great niche, is graced with a horn of plenty full of dignities, which he is pouring out upon the earth, and the victories that she has above her, after plenty full of dignities, which he is pouring out upon the earth, and the victories that she has above her,
after the likeness of the other, support the head of the Emperor Trajan. There is also Envy, who is devouring vipers and appears to be bursting with venom, and above, at the top of the scene, are the arms of Cardinal Farnese, supported by fame and virtue. In the other scene, the same Pope Paul is seen all intent on his buildings, and in particular on that of St. Pietro upon the Vatican, and therefore they are kneeling before the Pope, painting, sculpture, and architecture, who, having unfolded the design of the ground plan of that St. Pietro, are receiving orders to execute the work and to carry it to completion. Besides these figures, there is resolution, who, opening the breast, lays bare the heart, with solicitude and riches near. In a niche is abundance, with two victories that hold the effigy of Vespasian, and in the center, in another niche, that divides one scene from the other, is Christian religion, with two victories above her that hold the head of Numo Pompilius, and the arms that are above the scene are those of Cardinal San Giorgio, who built that palace, in the other scene, which is opposite to that of the dispatchings of the court, is the universal peace made among Christians by the agency of Pope Paul III, and particularly between the Emperor Charles V and Francis, King of France, who are portrayed there. Wherefore there may be seen peace-burning arms, the temple of Janus being closed in fury and chains, of the two great niches that are on either side of the scene, the one in Concord, with two victories above her that are holding the head of the Emperor Titus, and in the other is Charity with many children, all above the niche are two victories holding the head of Augustus, and over all are the arms of Charles V, supported by victory and rejoicing. The whole work is full of the most beautiful inscriptions and mottos composed by Giovio. And there is one in particular which says that those pictures were all executed in a hundred days, which indeed, like a young man, I did do, being such that I gave no thought to anything but satisfying that Lord, who, as I have said, desired to have the work finished in that time for a particular purpose. But in truth, although I exerted myself greatly in making cartoons and studying that work, I confess that I did wrong in putting it afterwards in the hands of assistants, in order to execute it more quickly, as I was obliged to do, for it would have been better to toil over it a hundred months and do it with my own hand, whereby, although I would not have done it in such a way as to satisfy my wish, to please the cardinal, and to maintain my own honor, I would at least have had the satisfaction of having executed it with my own hand. However, that error was the reason that I resolved that I would never again do any work without finishing it entirely by myself, over a first sketch done by the hands of assistants from designs by my hand. In that work the Spaniards, Bezzero and Roviali, who laboured much in it in my company, gained no little practice and also Battista de Bagna Cavallo of Bologna, Bastiano Fiore of Arezzo, Giovan Paolo del Borgo, Fra Salvatore Froci of Arezzo, and many other young men. At that time I went often in the evening at the end of day's work to see the above-named most illustrious Cardinal Farnese at supper, where they were always present to entertain him with beautiful and honorable discourse, Monza, Annabel Caro, Monsieur Gandalfo, Monsieur Claudio Ptolemy, Monsieur Romolo Almaceo, Monsignor Giovio, and many other men of learning and distinction of whom the court of that lord is ever full. One evening, among others, the conversation turned to the museum of Giovio and to the portraits of illustrious men that he had placed therein. With beautiful order and inscriptions, and one thing leading to another, as happens in conversation, Monsieur Giovio said that he had always had, and still had, a great desire to add to his museum and his book of eulogies a treatise with an account of the men who had been illustrious in the art of design from Cinebu down to our own times. Enlarging on this, he showed that he had certainly great knowledge and judgment in the matters of our arts, but it is true that, being content to treat the subject in gross, he did not consider it in detail, and often in speaking of those craftsmen, 
either confused their names, surnames, birthplaces, and works, or did not relate things exactly as they were, but rather, as I have said, in gross. When Giovio had finished his discourse, the cardinal turned to me and said, What do you say, Giorgio? Will not that be a fine work and a noble labor? Fine indeed, most illustrious excellency, I answered. If Giovio be assisted by someone of our arts to put things in their places and relate them as they really are. That I say because, although his discourse has been marvelous, he has confused and mistaken many things one for another. Then, replied the cardinal, being besought by Giovio, Caro Ptolemy, and the others, you might give him a summary and an order to count of all those craftsmen and their works, according to the order of time, and so your arts will receive from you this benefit as well. That undertaking, although I know it to be beyond my powers, I promise most willingly to execute to the best of my ability. And so, having set myself down to search through my records and the notes that I had written on that subject from my earliest youth, as a sort of pastime and because of the affection that I bore to the memory of our craftsmen, every notice of whom was very dear to me, I gathered together everything that seemed to me to touch on the subject and took the whole to Giovio. And he, after he had much praised my labor, said to me, Giorgio, I would rather that you should undertake this task of setting everything down in the manner in which I see that you will be excellently well able to do it, because I have not the courage, not knowing the various manners, and being ignorant of many particulars that you are likely to know. Besides which, even if I were to do it, I would make it the most a little treatise like that of Pliny. Do what I tell you, Vasari, for I see by the specimen that you have given me in this account that it will prove something very fine. And then thinking that I was not very resolute in the matter, he caused Caro, Mons, Ptolemy, and others of my dearest friends to speak to me. Whereupon, having finally made up my mind, I set my hand to it, with the intention of giving it when finished to one of them, that he might revise and correct it, and then publish it under a name other than mine. End of section 21section 22 of lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume 10 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume 10 by giorgio vasari translated by gaston ducey de Vere. Giorgio Vasari, Description of the Works of Giorgio Vasari, Painter and Architect of Arezzo, Part 4. Meanwhile, I departed from Rome in the month of October of the year 1546, and came to Florence, and there executed for the nuns of the famous convent of the Murati, a picture in oils of a last supper for their refectory which work was allotted to me and paid for by Pope Paul III, who had a sister-in-law, once Countess Epitigliano, a nun in that convent. And then I painted in another picture Our Lady with the Infant Christ in her arms, who is espousing the Virgin Martyr St. Catherine with two other saints, which picture Monsieur Tommaso Cambi caused me to execute for a sister who was then abbess of the convent, of the Picaglo, without Florence. That finished, I painted two large pictures in oils for Monsignor de Rossi, Bishop of Pavia, of the family of the Counts of San Secondo. In one of these is St. Jerome, and in the other a Pieta, and they were both sent to France. Then, in the year 1547, I carried to completion for the Domo of Pisa, at the instance of Monsieur Bastiano del Sato, the Warden of Works, another altar picture that I had begun, and afterwards for my very dear friend Simon Corsi, a large picture in oils of Our Lady. Now, while I was executing these works, 
having carried nearly to completion the book of the lives of the craftsmen of design. There was scarcely anything left for me to do, but to have it transcribed in a good hand. When there presented himself to me, most opportunely, Don Gian Matteo Fratani of Romigni, a monk of Monte Oliveto, and a person of intelligence and learning, who decided that I should execute some works for him in the church and monastery of St. Maria di Scola of Romigni, where he was abbot. He then, having promised to have it transcribed for me by one of his monks who was an excellent writer and to correct it himself, persuaded me to go to Romigni to execute with this occasion the altar picture in the high altar of that church, which is about three miles distant from the city. In that altar picture, I painted the Magi adoring Christ with an infinity of figures executed by me with much study in that solitary place, counterfeiting the men of the courts of the three kings in such a way, as well as I was able, that although they were all mingled together, yet one may recognize by the appearance of the faces to what country each belongs and to which king he is subject, for some have the flesh color white, some gray, and others dark. Besides which, the diversity of their vestments and the differences in their adornments make a pleasing variety. The altar picture has on either side of it two large pictures in which is the rest of the courts, with horses, elephants, and giraffes, and about the chapel, in various places, are distributed prophets, sibyls, and evangelists in the act of writing. In the cupola, or rather, tribune, I painted four great figures that treat the praises of Christ, of his genealogy and of the Virgin, and their Orpheus and Homer with some Greek mottos, Virgil with the motto, I am reddit et virgo, etc., and Dante with these verses, Tu se cole, qui lumina natura, nobilitas si, qui il suo fattori. Non si sedenio, di farsi tua fatura. With many other figures and inventions, of which there is no need to say any more. Then the work of writing the above-mentioned book and carrying it to completion, meanwhile continuing, I painted for the high altar of St. Francisco, in Romini, a large altar picture in oils of St. Francis, receiving the stigmata from Christ on the mountain of La Vina, copied from nature, and since that mountain is all of gray rocks and stones, and in like manner, St. Francis and his companion are gray, I counterfeited a sun within which is Christ, with a good number of seraphim, and so the work is varied, and the saint with other figures, all illumined by the splendor of that sun, and the landscape in shadow with a great variety of changing colors, all which is not displeasing to many persons, and was much extolled at that time by Cardinal Cotta Friera, legate in Romagna. Being then summoned from Romini to Ravenna, I executed an altar picture, as has been told in another place, for the new church of the Abbey of Classi, of the Order of Canadoli, painting wherein a Christ taken down from the cross and lying in the lap of Our Lady, and at this same time, I executed for diverse friends many designs, pictures, and other lesser works, which are so many and so varied that it would be difficult for me to remember even a part of them, and perhaps not pleasing for my readers to hear so many particulars. Meanwhile, the building of my house of Dorezzo had been finished, and I returned home, where I made designs for painting the hall, three chambers, and the facade, as if it were my own diversion during this summer. In those designs I depicted, among other things, all the places and provinces where I had labored, as if they were bringing tributes to represent the gains that I had made by their means to that house of mine. For the time being, however, I did nothing but the ceiling of the hall, which is passing rich in woodwork, with thirteen large pictures wherein are the celestial gods, and in four angles the four seasons of the year nude, who are gazing at a great picture that is in the center, in which, with figures the size of life, is excellence, who has envy and her feet and has seized fortune by the hair, and is beating both the one and the other, 
And a thing that was much commended at the time was that as you go round the hall, fortune being in the middle, from one side envy seems to be over fortune and excellence, and from another side excellence is over envy and fortune, as is seen often to happen in real life. Around the walls are abundance, liberality, wisdom, prudence, labor, honor, and other similar things, and below, all around, are stories of ancient painters, Apelles, Zeusus, Parhesius, Protogenes, and others, with various compartments and details that I omit for the sake of brevity. In a chamber also is the great medallion in the ceiling of carved woodwork. I painted Abraham, with God blessing his seed and promising to multiply it infinitely. And in four squares that are around that medallion, I painted peace, concord, virtue, and modesty. And since I have always adored the memory and the works of the ancients, and perceived that the method of painting in distemper colors was being abandoned, there came to me a desire to revive that mode of painting, and I executed the whole work in distemper, which method certainly does not deserve to be wholly despised or abandoned at the entrance of the chamber, as it were in jest. I painted a bride who has in one hand a rake, with which she seems to have raked up and carried away with her from her father's house everything that she has been able, and in the hand that is stretched in front of her, entering into the house of her husband, she has a lighted torch, signifying that where she goes she carries a fire that consumes and destroys everything. While I was passing my time thus, the year 1548 having come, Don Giovan Benedetto of Mantua, abbot of Saints Fiora e Lucila, a monastery of the Black Friars of Monte Cassino, who took infinite delight in manners of painting and was much my friend, prayed me that I should consent to paint a last supper or some such thing at the head of their refectory, whereupon I resolved to gratify his wish and began to think of doing something out of the common use, and so I determined in agreement with that good father, to paint for it the nuptials of Queen Esther and King Ahasuerus, all in a picture fifteen brachia long, and in oils, but first to set it in place and then to work at it there. That method, and I can speak with authority, for I have proved it, is in truth that which should be followed by one who wishes that his picture should have their true and proper lights, for the reason that, in fact, working at pictures in a place lower or other than that where they are to stand, causes changes in their lights, shadows, and many other properties. In that work, then, I strove to represent majesty and grandeur, and although I may not judge whether I succeeded, I know well that I disposed everything in such a manner, that there may be recognized in passing, good order all the manners of servants, pages, esquires, soldiers of the guard, the buttery, the credence, the musicians, a dwarf, and every other thing that is required for a magnificent and royal banquet. There may be seen, among others, the steward bringing the viands to the table, accompanied by a good number of pages dressed in livery, besides esquires and other servants, and at the ends of the table, which is oval, are lords and other great personages and courtiers who are standing on their feet, as is the custom, to see the banquet. King Azahorus is seated at table, a proud and enamored monarch, leaning upon the left arm and offering a cup of wine to the queen, in an attitude truly dignified and regal. In short, if I were to believe what I heard said of by persons at that time, and what I still hear from anyone who sees the work, I might consider that I had done something, but I know better how the matter stands, and what I would have done if my hand had followed that which I had conceived an idea. But that as it may, I applied it, and this I can declare freely, study and diligence. Above the work, on a spandrel of the vaulting, comes a Christ who is offering to the queen a crown of flowers, and this was done in fresco, and placed there to denote the spiritual conception of the story, which signifies that, the ancient synagogue being repudiated, Christ was espousing the new church of his faithful Christians. 
At this same time, I made the portrait of Luigi Guigidiani, brother of the Messer Francesco who wrote the history, because that Messer Luigi was very much my friend, and that year, being commissary of Arezzo, had caused me out of love for me to buy a very large property in land called Frassinato in Valdiciani, which has been the salvation and the greatest prop of my house, and will be the same for my successors, if, as I hope, they prove true to themselves. That portrait, which is in the possession of the heirs of that Messer Luigi, is said to be the best and the closest likeness of the infinite number that I have executed. But of the portraits that I have painted, which are so many, I will make no mention, because it would be a tedious thing. And, to tell the truth, I have avoided doing them to the best of my ability. That finished, I painted at the commission of Fra Mariotto di Castiglione of Arezzo, for the church of San Francisco in that city, an altar picture of Our Lady, St. Anne, St. Francis, and St. Sylvester. And at this time, I drew for Cardinal de Monti, my very good patron, who was then legate in Bologna, and afterwards became Pope Julius III, the design and plan of a great farm which was afterwards carried into execution at the foot of Monte San Savino, his native place, where I was several times at the orders of that lord, who was much delighted in building. Having gone, after I had finished these works, to Florence, I painted that summer on a banner for carrying in processions, belonging to the company of St. Giovanna di Peducci of Arezzo, that saint on one side preaching to the multitude, and on the other the same saint baptizing Christ. Which picture, as soon as it was finished, I sent to my house at Arezzo, that it might be delivered to the men of the above-named company. And it happened upon seeing Giorgio, Cardinal de Marniac, a Frenchman, passing through Arezzo and going to see my house for some other purpose, saw that banner, or rather, standard, and liking it, did his utmost to obtain it for sending to the king of France, offering a large price. But I would not break faith with those who had commissioned me to paint it, for, although many said to me that I could make another, I know not whether I could have done it as well and with equal diligence. And not long afterwards, I executed for Messer Annabelle Caro, according as he had requested me long before in a letter, which is printed, a picture of Adonis dying in the lap of Venus, after the invention of Theocritus, which work was afterwards taken to France, almost against my will, and given to Monsieur Abitzi de Beni, together with the Psyche, gazing with a lamp at Cupid, who wakens from his sleep, a spark from the lamp having scorched him. Those figures, all nude and large as life, were the reason that Alfonso di Tommaso Cambi, who was then a very beautiful youth, well-lettered, accomplished, and most gentle and courteous, had himself portrayed nude and at full length in the person of the huntsman, Endymion, beloved by the moon, whose white form and the fanciful landscape all around had their light from the brightness of the moon, which in the darkness of the night makes an effect passing natural and true, for the reason that I strove with all diligence to counterfeit the peculiar colors that the pale yellow light of the moon is wont to give to the things upon which it strikes. After this, I painted two pictures for sending to Ragusa, in one Our Lady, and in the other a Pieta, and then in a great picture for Francesco, both Our Lady with her son in her arms, and Joseph, and that picture, which I certainly executed with the greatest diligence that I knew, he took with him to Spain. These works finished, I went in the same year to see Cardinal de Monte at Bologna, where he was legate, and dwelling with him for some days, besides many other conversations, he contrived to speak so well and to persuade me with such good reasons, that, being constrained by him to do a thing, which up to that time I had refused to do, I resolved to take a wife, and so, by his desire, married a daughter of Francesco Balchi, a noble citizen of Arezzo. 
Having returned to Florence, I executed a great picture of Our Lady after a new invention of my own and with more figures, which was acquired by Messer Bindo Altavidi, who gave me a hundred crowns of gold for it and took it to Rome, where it is now in his house. Besides this, I painted many other pictures at the same time, as for Messer Bernadetto di Medici, for Messer Bartomeo Strada, an eminent physician, and for others of my friends of whom there was no need to speak. In those days, Gismondo Martelli had died in Florence, and having left instructions in his testament that an altar picture with Our Lady and some saint should be painted for the chapel of that noble family in St. Lorenzo, Luigi and Pandolfo Martelli, together with Monsieur Cosimo Bartoli, are very much my friends, besought me that I should execute that picture, having obtained leave from the Lord Duke Cosimo, the patron and first warden of works of that church, I consented to do it, but on condition that I should be allowed to paint in it something after my own fancy from the life of St. Gismondo, in allusion to the name of the testator, which agreement concluded, I remember to have heard that Filippo di Serbenalesco, the architect of that church, had given a particular form to all the chapels to the end, that there might be made for each not some little altar picture, but some large scene or picture which might fill the whole space. Wherefore, being disposed to follow in that respect the wishes and directions of Brunelleschi, and paying a regard rather to honor than to the little profit that I could obtain from that commission, which contemplated the painting of a small altar picture with few figures. I painted in an altarpiece ten brachia in breadth and thirteen in height, the story, or rather martyrdom, of the king St. Gismondo, when he, his wife, and his two sons were cast into a well by another king, or rather tyrant. I contrived that the ornamental border of that chapel, which is a semicircle, should serve as the opening of the gate of a great palace in the rustic order, through which there should be a view of a square court supported by pilasters and columns of the Doric order, and I arranged that through that opening there should be seen in the center an octagonal well with an ascent of steps around it, by which the executioners might ascend, carrying the two sons nude in order to cast them into the well. In the loggia around, I painted on one side people gazing upon that horrid spectacle, and on the other side, which is the left, I made some soldiers who, having seized by force the wife of the king, are carrying her towards the well in order to put her to death. And at the principal door I made a group of soldiers that are binding St. Gismondo, who, with his relaxed and patient attitude, shows that he is suffering most willingly that death and martyrdom and he stands gazing on four angels in the air, who are showing to him palms and crowns of martyrdom for himself, his wife, and his sons, which appears to give him complete comfort and consolation. I strove, likewise, to demonstrate the cruelty and fierce anger of the impious tyrant, who stands on the upper level of the court to behold his vengeance and the death of St. Gismondo, in short, so far as in me lay. I made every effort to give all the figures to the best of my ability, the proper expressions and the appropriate attitudes and spirited movements, and all that was required, how far I succeeded, that I shall leave to be judged by others. But this I must say, that I gave it all the study, labor, and diligence in my power and knowledge. Meanwhile, the Lord Duke Cosimo, desiring that the Book of Lives already brought almost to completion with the greatest diligence that I had found possible, and with the assistance of some of my friends, to be given to the printers. I gave it to Lorenzo Torrentino, printed to the Duke, and so the printing was begun. But not even the theories had been finished. When Pope Paul III, having died, I began to doubt that I might have to depart from Florence before that book was finished printing. Going, therefore, out of Florence to meet Cardinal de Monti, who was passing on his way to the conclave, I had no sooner made obeisance to him and spoken a few words. than he said, I go to Rome, and without a doubt I shall be Pope. 
Make haste if you have anything to do, and as soon as you hear the news, set out for Rome without awaiting other advice or other invitation. Nor did that prognostication prove false, for, being at Arezzo for that carnival, with certain festivities and masquerades were being arranged, the news came that the cardinal had become Julius the Third. whereupon I mounted straightway on horseback and went to Florence. Once, pressed by the duke, I went to Rome, in order to be present at the coronation of the new pontiff, and to take part in the preparation of the festivities. And so, arriving in Rome and dismounting at the house of Messer Bindo, I went to do reverence to his holiness and to kiss his feet, which done, the first words that he spoke to me were to remind me that what he had foretold of himself had not been false. Then, after he was crowned and settled down a little, the first thing that he wished to have done was to satisfy an obligation that he had to the memory of Antonio, the first and elder Cardinal de Monte, by means of a tomb to be made in St. Pietro a Montorio, of which the designs and models having been made, it was executed in marble, as has been related fully in another place. And meanwhile I painted the altar picture of that chapel, in which I represented the conversion of St. Paul, but to vary it from that which Bonarotti had executed in the Pauline chapel, I made St. Paul young, as he himself writes, and fallen from his horse, and led blind by the soldiers to Ananias, from whom, by the imposition of hands, he receives the lost sight of his eyes, and is baptized, in which work, either because the space was restricted, or whatever may have been the reason, I did not satisfy myself completely although it was perhaps not displeasing to others, and in particular to Michelangelo. For that pontiff, likewise, I executed another altar picture for a chapel in the palace, but this, for reasons given elsewhere, was afterwards taken by me to Arezzo and placed at the high altar of the Piev. If, however, I had not fully satisfied either myself or others in the last-named picture, or in that of St. Pietro a Montorio, it would have been no matter for surprise, because, being obliged to be continually at the beck and call of that pontiff, I was kept always moving, or rather, occupied in making architectural designs, and particularly because I was the first who designed and prepared all the inventions of the Vigna Julia, which he caused to be erected at incredible expense. And although it was executed afterwards by others, yet it was I who always committed to drawing the caprices of the Pope, who were then given to Michelangelo to revise and correct. Jacopo Barazzi of Vignola finished, after many designs by his own hand, the rooms, halls, and many other ornaments of that place. But the lower fountain was made under the direction of myself and of Animati who afterwards remained there, and made the loggia that is over the fountain. In that work, however, it was not possible for a man to show his ability or to do anything right, because from day to day new caprices came into the head of the Pope, which had to be carried into execution, according to the daily instructions given by Messer Pier Giovanni Aliato, Bishop of Forli. During that time, being obliged in the year 1550 to go twice to Florence on other affairs. The first time I finished the picture of St. Gismondo, which the Duke went to see in the house of Monsieur Ottaviano di Medici, where I executed it, and he liked it so much that he said to me that when I had finished my work in Rome, I should come to serve him in Florence, where I would receive orders as to what was to be done. I then returned to Rome, where I gave completion to those works that I had begun, and painted a picture of the beheading of St. John for the high altar of the company of the Misericordia, different not a little from those that are generally done, which I set in place in the year 1553. And then I wished to return, but I was forced to execute for Messer Bindo Altavati, not being able to refuse him, two very large loggi in stucco work and fresco. One of them I painted was at his via, made with the new method of architecture, because, the loggia being so large that it was not possible to turn the vaulting without danger, 
I had it made with armatures of wood, matting, and canes, all of which was done the stucco work in fresco painting, as if the vaulting were of masonry. And even so it appears and is believed to be by all who see it. And it is supported by many ornamental columns of variegated marble, antique and rare. The other loggia is on the ground floor of his house on the bridge and is covered with scenes in fresco. And after that I painted for the ceiling of an antechamber four large pictures and oils of the four seasons of the year. These finished, I was forced to make for Andrea della Fonte, who was much my friend, a portrait from life of his wife, and with it I gave him a large picture of Christ bearing the cross, with figures the size of life, which I made for a kinsman of the Pope, but afterwards had not chosen to present to him. For the Bishop of Vesona, I painted a dead Christ, supported by Nicodemus and by two angels, and for Pierre Antonio Bandini, a nativity of Christ, an effective night with variety in its invention. While I was executing these works, I was also watching to see what the Pope was intending to do, and finally I saw that there was little to be expected from him, and that it was useless to labor in his service. Wherefore, notwithstanding that I had already executed the cartoons for painting in fresco, the loggia that is over the fountain of the above-named Vidna, I resolved that I would at all costs go to serve the Duke of Florence, and the rather because I was pressed to do this by Monsieur Averado Serristori and Bishop Ricasoli the ambassadors of His Excellency in Rome, and also in letters by Monsieur Sforzo Almeni, his cupbearer and chief chamberlain. I transferred myself, therefore, to Arezzo, in order to make my way from there to Florence. But first I was forced to make for Monsieur Menobetto, Bishop of Arezzo, as for my lord and most dear friend, a life-size picture of patience in the form that has since been used by Signor Ecole, Duke of Ferrara, as his device, as the reverse of his medal, which work finished, I came to kiss the hand of the Lord Duke Cosimo, by whom in his kindness I was received very warmly, and while it was being considered what I should first take in hand, I caused Cristofano Girardi of the Borgo to paint in chiaroscuro after my designs the facade of Monsieur Sforzo Almini, in that manner, and with those inventions that have been described at great length in another place. Now at that time I happened to be one of the Lord's priors in the city of Arezzo, whose office it is to govern that city, but I was summoned by letters by that Lord Duke into his service, and absolved from that duty, and having come to Florence, I found that His Excellency had begun that year to build that apartment of his palace, which is towards the Piazza del Grano, under the direction of the woodcarver Tasso, who was then architect to the palace. The roof had been placed so low that all those rooms had little elevation, and were, indeed, altogether dwarfed. But, since to raise the crossbeams in the whole roof would be a long affair, I advised that a series of timbers should be placed by way of border, with sunk compartments two braccia and a half in extent, between the crossbeams of the roof, with a range of consoles in the perpendicular line, so as to make a frieze of about two braccia above the timbers, which plan greatly pleasing his excellency. He gave order straightway that it should be done, and that Tasso should execute the woodwork and the compartments, within which was to be painted the genealogy of the gods, and that afterwards the work should be continued in the other rooms. End of section 22. Section 23 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston du C. de Vere. Giorgio Vasari, 
Description of the Works of Giorgio Vasari, Painter and Architect of Arezzo, Part 5. While the work for those sailings was being prepared, having obtained leave from the Duke, I went to spend two months between Arezzo and Cortona, partly to give completion to some affairs of my own, and partly to finish a work in fresco begun on the walls and vaulting of the Company of Jesus at Cortona. In that place, I painted three pictures of the life of Jesus Christ and all the sacrifices offered to God in the Old Testament, from Cain and Abel down to the prophet Nehemiah. And there, during that time, I also furnished designs and models for the fabric of the Madonna Nouveau, without the city. This work for the Company of Jesus being finished, I returned to Florence in the year 1555 with all my family to serve Duke Cosimo, and there I began and finished the compartments, walls, and ceiling of the above-named upper hall, called the Sala Degli Elementi, painting in the compartments, which are eleven, the castration of heaven in the air. In a terrace beside that hall I painted on the ceiling the actions of Saturn and Ops, and then on the ceiling of another great chamber all the story of Ceres and Proserpine and in a still larger chamber, which is beside the last, likewise on the ceiling, which is very rich, stories of the goddess Berecynthia, and of Cybele with her triumph, and the four seasons, and on the walls all the twelve months. On the ceiling of another not so rich, I painted the birth of Jove, and the goat Amethia, nursing him, with the rest of the other most notable things related of him. In another terrace beside the same room, much adorned with stones and stucco work, other things of Jove and Juno. And finally, in the next chamber, the birth of Hercules and all his labors. All that could not be included on the ceilings was placed in the friezes of each room, or has been placed in the Aris tapestries that the Lord Duke has caused to be woven for each room from my cartoons, corresponding to the pictures high up on the walls. I shall not speak of the grotesques, ornaments, and pictures of the stairs, nor of many other smaller details executed by my hand in the apartment of rooms, because, besides that I hope that a longer account may be given of them on another occasion, every one may see them at his pleasure and judge of them. While these upper rooms were being painted, they were built the others that are on the level of the great hall and are connected in a perpendicular line with the first named, with a very convenient system of staircases, public and private, that lead from the highest to the lowest quarters of the palace. Meanwhile, Tasso died, and the Duke, who had a very great desire that the palace, which had been built at haphazard, in various stages and at various times, and more for the convenience of the officials than with any good order, should be put to rights, resolved that he would, at all cost, have it reconstructed in so far as that was possible, and that in time the great hall should be painted, and that Bandinelli should continue the audience chamber already begun, in order, therefore, to bring the whole palace into accord, harmonizing the work already done with that which was to be done. He ordained that I should make several plans and designs, and finally a wooden model after some that it pleased him, the better to be able to proceed to accommodate all the apartments according to his pleasure, and to change and put straight the old stairs, which appeared to him too steep, ill-conceived, and badly made, to which work I set my hand, although it seemed to me a difficult enterprise and beyond my powers, and I executed as best I could a very large model, which is now in the possession of his excellency, more to obey him than with any hope that I might succeed. That model, when it was finished, pleased him much, whether by his good fortune or mine, or because of the great desire that I had to give satisfaction. Whereupon I set my hand to building, and little by little, doing now one thing and now another, the work has been carried to the condition wherein it may now be seen. And while the rest was being done, I decorated with very rich stucco work in a varied design 
of compartments, the first eight of the new rooms that aren't our level with the Great Hall, what with saloons, chambers, and a chapel, with various pictures and innumerable portraits from life that come in the scenes, beginning with the elder Cosimo and calling each room by the name of some great and famous person descended from him. In one, then, are the most notable actions of that Cosimo and those virtues that were most peculiar to him, with his greatest friends and servants and portraits of his children, all from life, and so also that of the elder Lorenzo, that of his son Pope Leo, that of Pope Clement, that of Signor Giovanni, the father of our great duke, and that of the Lord Duke Cosimo himself. In the chapel is a large and very beautiful picture by the hand of Raffaello da Urbino, between a Saint Cosimo and a Saint Damiano, painted by my hand, to whom that chapel is dedicated. Then, in like manner, in the upper rooms, painted for the Lady Duchess Leonora, which are four, are actions of illustrious women, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and Tuscan, one to each chamber. But of these, besides that I have spoken of them elsewhere, there will be a full account in the dialogue which I am about to give to the world, as I have said, for to describe everything here would have taken too long. For all these, my labors, continuous, difficult, and great as they were, I was rewarded largely and richly by the magnanimous liberality of the great duke, in addition to my salaries, with donations and with commodious and honorable houses, both in Florence and in the country, to the end that I might be able to more advantageously to serve him. Besides which, he has honored me with the supreme magistracy of Gonfalier, and other offices in my native city of Arezzo, with the right to substitute in them one of the citizens of that place, not to mention that to my brother, Sir Piero, he has given offices of profit in Florence, and likewise extraordinary favors to my relatives in Arezzo, so that I shall never be weary of confessing the obligation that I feel towards the Lord for so many marks of affection. Returning to my works, I must go on to say that by my most excellent Lord resolved to carry into execution a project that he had had for a long time, a painting the great hall, a conception worthy of his lofty and profound spirit. I know not whether, as he said, I believed jesting with me, because he thought for certain that I would get it off his hands, so that he would see it finished in his lifetime. Or it may have been from some other private, and, as has always been true of him, most prudent judgment. The result, in short, was that he commissioned me to raise the cross beams and the whole roof thirteen braccia above the height of that time, to make the ceiling of wood, and to overlay it with gold and paint it full of scenes in oils, a vast and most important undertaking, and, if not too much for my courage, perhaps too much for my powers. However, whether it was that the confidence of that great lord and the good fortune that he has in his very enterprise raised me beyond what I am in myself, or that the hopes and opportunities of so fine a subject furnished me with much greater faculties, or that the grace of God, and this I was bound to place before any other thing, supplied me with strength. I undertook it, and, as has been seen, executed it in contradiction to the opinion of many persons, and not only in much less time than I had promised, and the work might be considered to require, but in less than even I, or his most illustrious excellency, ever thought, and I can well believe that he was astonished and well satisfied, because it came to be executed at the greatest emergency, and the finest occasion that could have required, and this was, that the cause of so much haste may be known, that a settlement had been concluded about the marriage, which was being arranged between our most illustrious prince and the daughter of the late emperor and sister of the present one. And I thought it is my duty to make every effort that on the occasion of such festivities that hall, which was the principal apartment of the palace, 
and the one wherein the most important ceremonies were to be celebrated, might be available for enjoyment. And here I will leave it to the judgment of everyone, not only in our arts, but also outside them. If only he has seen the greatness and variety of that work, to decide whether the extraordinary importance of the occasion shall not be my excuse, if in such haste I have not given complete satisfaction in so great a variety of wars on land and sea, stormings of cities, batteries, assaults, skirmishes, buildings of cities, public councils, ceremonies ancient and modern, triumphs, and so many other things for which, not to mention anything else, the sketches, designs, and cartoons of so great a work required a very long time. I will not speak of the nude bodies in which the perfection of our arts consists, or of the landscapes wherein all those things were painted, all which I had to copy from nature on the actual site and spot, even as I did with the many captains, generals, and other chiefs and soldiers that were in the emprises that I painted. In short, I will venture to say that I had occasion to defect on that ceiling, almost everything that human thought and imagination can conceive. All the varieties of bodies, faces, vestments, habiliments, casks, helmets, cuirasses, various headdresses, horses, harness, caparisons, artillery of every kind, navigations, tempests, storms of rain and snow, and so many other things that I am not able to remember them. But anyone who sees the work may easily imagine what labors and what vigils I endured in executing, with the greatest study in my power about forty large scenes, and some of them, pictures ten brachia in every direction, with figures very large and in every manner, and although some of my young disciples worked with me there, they sometimes gave me assistance and sometimes not, for the reason that at times I was obliged, as they know, to repaint everything with my own hand, and go over the whole picture again, to the end that all might be in one and the same manner. These stories, I say, treat of the history of Florence, from the building of the city down to the present day, the division into quarters, the cities brought to submission, the enemies vanquished, the cities subjugated, and finally, the beginning and end of the war of Pisa on one side, and on the other likeness, the beginning and end of the War of Siena, one carried on and concluded by the popular government in a period of fourteen years, and the other by the Duke in fourteen months, as may be seen. Besides all the rest that is on the ceiling and will be on the walls, each eighty brachia in length and twenty in height, which I am even now painting in fresco, and hope likewise to discuss later in the above-mentioned dialogue. And all this that I have sought to say hitherto has been for no other cause, but to show with what diligence I have applied myself and still apply myself to matters of art, and with what good reasons I could excuse myself, if in some cases, which I believe indeed are many, I have failed. I will add also that about the same time I received orders to design all the arches to be shown to His Excellency for the purpose of determining the whole arrangement of the numerous festive preparations already described, executed in Florence for the nuptials of the most illustrious Lord Prince, of which I had then to carry into execution and finish a great part, to cause to be painted after my designs, in ten pictures each fourteen brachia high and eleven broad, all the squares of the principal cities of the Dominion, drawn in perspective with their original builders and their devices, also to have finished the head wall of the above-named hall, begun by Bandinelli, and to have a scene made for the other, the greatest and richest that was ever made by any one, and finally to execute the principal stairs of that palace, with their vestibules, the court, and the columns, in the manner that everyone knows that has been described above, with fifteen cities of the empire, and of the Tyrol, depicted from the reality in his many pictures. Not little, also, has been the time that I have spent in those same days in pushing forward the construction, from the time when I first began it, of the loggia and of the vast fabric of the magistrates, 
facing towards the River Arno, than which I have never had built anything more difficult or more dangerous, from its being founded over the river, and even, one might say, in the air. But it was necessary, besides other reasons, in order to attach to it, as has been done. The great corridor, which crosses the river and goes from the Ducal Palace to the Palace and Garden of the Pity, which corridor was built under my direction and after my design in five months, although it is a work that one might think impossible to finish in less than five years. In addition, it was also my task to cause to be reconstructed and increased with the same nuptials in the great tribune of St. Spirito the new machinery for the festival that used to be held in St. Felice in Piazza, which was all reduced to the greatest possible perfection, so that there are no longer any of those dangers that used to be incurred in that festival. And under my charge, likewise, have been the works of the palace and church of the Knights of St. Stephen at Pisa, and the tribune, or rather cupola, of the Madonna del Unito in Pistoria which is a work of the greatest importance, for all which, without excusing my imperfection, which I know only too well, if I have achieved anything of the good, I render infinite thanks to God, from whom I still hope to have such help, that I may see finished, whatever that may be, the terrible undertaking of the walls in the hall, to the full satisfaction of my lords, who already for a period of thirteen years have given me opportunities to execute vast works with honor and profit for myself, after which, weary, aged, and outworn, I may be at rest, and if for various reasons I have executed the works described, for the most part with something of rapidity and haste, this I hope to do at my leisure, seeing that the Lord Duke is content that I should not press it, but should do it at my ease, granting me all the repose and recreation that I myself could desire. Thus, last year, being tired by the many works described above, he gave me leave that I might go about for some months to divert myself, and so, setting out to travel, I passed over little less than the whole of Italy, seeing again innumerable friends and patrons and the works of various excellent craftsmen as I have related above in another connection. Finally, being in Rome on my way to return to Florence, I went to kiss the feet of the most holy and most blessed Pope Pius V, and he commissioned me to execute for him in Florence an altar picture for sending to his convent and church of Bosco, which he was then having built in his native place, near Alexandria della Paglia. Having then returned to Florence, remembering the command that His Holiness had laid upon me and the many marks of affection that he had shown, I painted for him, as he had commissioned me, an altar picture of the adoration of the Magi, and when he heard that it had been carried by me to completion, he sent me a message that to please him, and that he might confer with me over some thoughts in his mind, I should go with that picture to Rome but particularly for the purpose of discussing the fabric of St. Pietro, which he showed himself to have very much at heart, having therefore made preparations with the hundred crowns that he sent me for that purpose, and having sent the picture before me. I went to Rome, and after I had been there a month and had had many conversations with his holiness, and had advised him not to permit any alterations to be made in the arrangements of Bonarotti, for the fabric of St. Pietro, and had executed some designs. He commanded me to make for the high altar of the church of Bosco not an altar picture such as is customary, but an immense structure almost in the manner of a triumphal arch, with two large panels, one in front and the other behind, and in smaller pictures about thirty scenes filled with many figures, all which have been carried very near completion. At that time I obtained the gracious leave of His Holiness, who with infinite lovingness and condescension sent me the poles expedited free of charge to erect in the Piève of Arezzo a chapel and decanate, which is the principal chapel of that Piève, under the patronage of myself and of my house, endowed by me and painted by my hand, and offered to the divine goodness as an acknowledgment, although but a trifle, 
of the great obligation that I feel to the divine majesty for the innumerable graces and benefits that he is designed to bestow upon me. The altar picture of that chapel is in form very similar to that described above, which has been in part the reason that it has been brought back to my memory, for it is isolated and consists likewise of two pictures, one in front, already mentioned above, and one at the back with the story of St. George, with pictures of certain saints on either side, and at the foot smaller pictures with their stories, those saints whose bodies are in the most beautiful tomb below the altar, with other principal relics of the city. In the center comes a tabernacle passing well arranged for the sacrament, because it serves for both the one altar and the other, and it is embellished with stories of the Old Testament and the New, all in keeping with that mystery, as has been told in part elsewhere. I had forgotten to say also that the year before when I went the first time to kiss the Pope's feet, I took the road by Perugia in order to set in place three large altar pieces executed for a refectory of the Black Friars of St. Piero in that city, in one that in the center, in the marriage of Cana in Galilee, at which Christ performed the miracle of converting water into wine. In the second, on the right hand, is Elisha the prophet, sweetening with meal the bitter pot, the food of which, spoiled by colocynths, his prophets were not able to eat. And in the third is St. Benedict, to whom a lay brother announces at a time a very great dearth, and at the very moment when his monks were lacking food, that some camels laden with meal have arrived at his door, and he sees that the angels of God are miraculously bringing to him a vast quantity of meal. For Signor Gentilini, mother of Signor Giappino, and Signor Paolo Vitelli, I painted in Florence and sent from there to Citta di Castello, a great altar picture in which is the coronation of Our Lady, on high a dance of angels and at the foot many figures larger than life, which picture was placed in San Francesco in that city, for the church of Poggia a Calano, a via of the Lord Duke. I painted an altar picture of the dead Christ in the lap of his mother, St. Cosimo and St. Damiano, contemplating him, and in the air an angel who, weeping, displays the mysteries of the passion of our Savior, and in the church of the Carmen at Florence, in the chapel of Matteo and Simon Botti, my very dear friends, there was placed above the same time an altar picture by my hand, wherein is Christ crucified, with Our Lady, St. John, and the Magdalene weeping. Then I executed two great pictures for Jacopo Capilni, the sending to France, in one of which is spring and in the other autumn, with large figures and new inventions, and in another an even larger picture, a dead Christ supported by two angels, with God the Father on high. To the nuns of St. Maria Navavella of Arezzo, I sent likewise in those days, or a little before, an altar picture in which is the Virgin receiving the Annunciation from the angel, and at the sides two saints, and for the nuns of Lugo in the Magello, of the Order of Camaldo. Another altar picture that is in the inner choir, containing Christ crucified, Our Lady, St. John, and Mary Magdalene, for Luca Torrigiani, who is very much my intimate and friend, and who desired to have among the many things that he possesses of our art, a picture by my own hand, in order to keep it near him. I painted in a very large picture a nude Venus with three Greek graces about her, one of whom is attiring her head, another holds her mirror, and the third is pouring water into a vessel to bathe her, which picture I strove to execute with the greatest study and diligence that I was able, in order to satisfy my own mind no less than that of so sweet and dear a friend. I also executed for Antonio de Nobili, treasurer general to his excellency and my affectionate friend, besides his portrait, being forced to do it against my inclination, a head of Jesus Christ taken from the words in which Lentulus writes of his effigy, both of which were done with diligence, and likewise another somewhat larger, but similar to that named above, the Signor Mandragoni, 
Now the first person in the service of Don Francesco di Medici, Prince of Florence and Siena, which I presented to his lordship because he is much affected towards our arts and every talent, to the end that he might remember from the sight of it that I love him and am his friend. I have also in mind and hope to finish soon a large picture, a most fanciful work, which is intended the Signor Antonio Montalvo, Lord of Sesesta, who is deservedly the first chamberlain, the most trusty companion of our Duke, and so sweet and loving and intimate and friend, not to say a superior to me, that if my hand shall accomplish the desire, that I have to leave to him a proof by that hand of the affection that I bear him. It will be recognized how much I honor him and how dearly I wish that the memory of a lord so honored and so loyal and beloved by me shall live among posterity, seeing that he exerts himself willingly in favoring all the beautiful intellects that labor in our profession or take delight in design. For the Lord Prince, Don Francesco, I have executed recently two pictures that he has sent to Toledo in Spain, to his sister, the Lady Duchess Leonora, his mother, and for himself a little picture in the manner of a miniature, with forty figures, what with great and small, according to a very beautiful invention of his own. For Felipe Salviati, I finished not long since an altar picture that is going to the sisters of St. Vincenzio at Prato, wherein on high is Our Lady arrived in heaven and crowned, and at the foot the apostles around the sepulchre. For the black friars of the Badia in Florence, likewise, I am painting an altarpiece of the Assumption of Our Lady, which is near completion, with the apostles and figures larger than life, and other figures at the side, and around its stories and ornaments accommodated in a novel manner. And since the Lord Duke, so truly excellent in everything, takes pleasure not only in the building of palaces, cities, fortresses, harbors, loggi, public squares, gardens, fountains, vias, and other such like things, beautiful, magnificent, and most useful, for the benefit of his people, but also particularly in building new and reducing to better form and greater beauty as a truly Catholic prince the temples and sacred churches of God, in imitation of the great King Solomon, recently has caused me to remove the tremezzo of the church of St. Maria Novella, which had robbed it of all its beauty, and a new and very rich choir was made behind the high altar in order to remove that occupying a great part of the center of that church, which makes it appear a new church and most beautiful, as indeed it is and because things that have not order and proportion among themselves can never be entirely beautiful. He has ordained that there shall be made in the side aisles, between column and column, in such a manner as to correspond to the centers of the arches, rich ornaments of stone in a novel form, which are to serve as chapels, with altars in the center, and are all to be in one of two manners, and that then in the altar pictures that are to go within these ornaments, seven brachia in height and five in breadth, there shall be executed paintings after the will and pleasure of the patrons of the chapels. Within one of those ornaments of stone made for my design, I have executed for the very Reverend Monsignor Alessandro Strozzi, Bishop of Volterra, my old and most loving patron, a Christ crucified according to the vision of St. Anselm, namely with the seven virtues, without which we cannot ascend the seven steps to Jesus Christ, and with other considerations by the same saint, and in the same church, within another of those ornaments, I have painted for the excellent Maestro Andrea Pascali, physician to the Lord Duke, a resurrection of Jesus Christ in the manner that God has inspired me, to please that Maestro Andrea, who is much my friend, and a similar work our great Duke has desired to have done in the immense church of St. Croce in Florence, namely, that the tremezzo should be removed and that the choir should be made behind the high altar, bringing that altar somewhat forward and placing upon it a new and rich tabernacle for the most holy sacrament, all adorned with gold, figures, and scenes, and in addition, 
that in the same manner that has been told of St. Maria Nabella, there should be made there fourteen chapels against the walls, with greater expense and ornamentation than those described above, because that church is much larger than the other, and the altarpieces to accompany the two by Salviati and Bronzino are to be all the principal mysteries of the Saviour, from the beginning of his passion to the sending of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, which picture of the sending of the Holy Spirit having made the design of the chapels and ornaments of stone, I have in hand the Monsieur Agnola Buffoli, treasurer general to our lords, and my particular friend, and I finished not long since two large pictures that are in the magistry of the Nine Conservatory, besides St. Pietro, Chiragio, in one of the head of Christ, and in the other a Madonna. But since I should take too long if I sought to recount in detail the many other pictures, designs without number, models and masquerades that I have executed, and because this much is enough, and more than enough, I shall say nothing more of myself, save that however great and important have been the things that I have continually suggested to Duke Cosimo, I have never been able to equal, much less to surpass, the greatness of his mind. And this will be seen clearly in the third sacristy that he wishes to build, besides St. Lorenzo, large and similar to that which Michelangelo built in the past, but all of variegated marvels and mosaics, in order to deposit there, in tombs most honorable and worthy of his power and grandeur, the remains of his dead children, of his father, and mother of the magnanimous Duchess Leonora, his consort, and of himself, for which I have already made a model after his taste, and according to the orders received from him by me, which, when carried into execution, will cause it to be a novel, most magnificent, and truly regal mausoleum. This much, then, it must suffice to have said of myself, who am now come after so many labors at the age of fifty-five years and look to live so long as it shall please God, honoring him, ever at the service of my friends, and working in so far as my strength shall allow, for the benefit and advantage of these most noble arts. End of section 23section 24 of lives of the most eminent painters, sculptors, and architects Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claudia Caldi. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari, translated by Gaston Ducé de Ver. The author to the Craftsman of Design. Honoured and noble craftsmen, for whose profit and advantage, chiefly, I set myself a second time to so long a labour. I now find that by the favour and assistance of the divine grace, I have accomplished in full that which at the beginning of this my present task I promised myself to do, for which result, rendering thanks first to God and afterwards to my lords, who have granted me the facilities whereby I have been able to do this advantageously. I must then give repose to my weary pen and brain, which I shall do as soon as I shall have made some brief observations. If then it should appear to any one that in my writing I have been at times rather long and even somewhat prolix, let him put it down to this, that I have sought as much as I have been able to be clear, and before any other thing, to set down my story in such a manner that what has not been understood the first time, or not expressed satisfactorily by me, might be made manifest at any cost. And if what has been said once has been at times repeated in another place, the reasons for this have been two. First, that the matter that I was treating required it, and then, that during the time when I rewrote and reprinted the work, I broke off my writing more than once, for a period not of days merely, but of months, either for journeys or because of a superabundance of labours, works of painting, designs and buildings, 
Besides which, for a man like myself, I confess it freely, it is almost impossible to avoid every error. To those to whom it might appear that I have overpraised any craftsman, whether old or modern, and who, comparing the old with those of the present age, might laugh at them, I know not what else to answer, save that my intention has always been to praise not absolutely, but, as the saying is, relatively, having regard to place, time, and other similar circumstances. And in truth, although Giotto, for example, was much extolled in his day, I know not what would have been said of him, as of other old masters, if he had lived in the time of Buonarroti, whereas the men of this age, which is at the topmost height of perfection, would not be in the position that they are if those others had not first been such as they were before us. In short, let it be believed that what I have done in praising or censuring I have done not with an ulterior object, but only to speak the truth or what I have believed to be the truth. But one cannot always have the goldsmith's balance in the hand, and he who has experienced what writing is, and particularly when one has to make comparisons, which are by their very nature odious, or to pronounce judgments, will hold me excused. And I know only too well how great have been the labours, hardships, and monies that I have devoted over many years to this work. Such indeed, and so many, have been the difficulties that I have experienced therein, that many a time I would have abandoned it in despair, if the succour of many true and good friends, to whom I shall always be deeply indebted, had not given me courage and persuaded me to persevere, they lending me all the loving aids that have been in their power, of notices, advices, and comparisons of various things, about which, although I had seen them, I was not a little perplexed and dubious. Those aids, indeed, have been such that I have been able to lay bare the pure truth and bring this work into the light of day, in order to revive the memory of so many rare and extraordinary intellects, which was almost entirely buried, for the benefit of those who shall come after us. In doing which I have found no little assistance, as has been told elsewhere, in the writings of Lorenzo Ghiberti, Domenico Ghirlandaio, and Raffaele d'Urbino. But although I have lent them willing faith, nevertheless I have always sought to verify their statements by a sight of the works, for the reason that long practice teaches a diligent painter to be able to recognize the various manners of craftsmen, not otherwise than a learned and well-practiced chancellor knows the various and diverse writings of his equals, or any one the characters of his nearest and most familiar friends and relatives. Now, if I have achieved the end that I have desired, which has been to benefit and at the same time to delight, that will be a supreme satisfaction to me. And even if it be otherwise, it will be a contentment for me, or at least an alleviation of pain, to have endured fatigue in an honourable work such as should make me worthy of pity among all choice spirits, if not of pardon. But to come at last to the end of this long discourse, I have written as a painter, and with the best order and method that I have been able, and as for language in that which I speak, whether it be Florentine or Toscan, and in the most easy and facile manner at my command, leaving the long and ornate periods, choice words, and other ornaments of learned speech and writing, to such as have not, as I have, a hand rather for brushes than for the pen, and a head rather for designs than for writing. And if I have scattered throughout the work many terms peculiar to our arts, of which perchance it has not occurred to the brightest and greatest lights of our language to avail themselves, I have done this because I could do no less, and in order to be understood by you, my craftsmen, for whom, chiefly, as I have said, I set myself to this labour. For the rest, then, I, having done all that I have been able, accept it willingly, and expect not from me what I know not, and what is not in my power, satisfying yourselves of my good intention, which is, and ever will be, to benefit and please others. 
the year 25 Augusti 1567. Concedimus licenziam et facultatem impune et sine ullo pregiudicio imprimendi Florentia vitas pictorum, sculptorum et architectorum, tanquam affidet religione nullo pacto adienas, set potius valde consonas in quorum fidem, etc. Guido Servidius, prepositus et vicarius generalis Florentia. End of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 10, by Giorgio Vasari, translated by Gaston Ducé de Vere.